Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I will call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. Thank you all for joining us here uh, in the council chambers. Thank you for joining us online as well. We will start our meeting as we always do. If you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again. Thanks to everybody who is here this evening. Thanks to everybody watching. Uh, we have a full agenda and a very exciting agenda. It's not often here at our Bloomington City Council meetings that we get to honor a Baseball Hall of Famer. So I'm very happy that is on our agenda this evening. Uh, as we go through the agenda, Council, uh, we have a number of introductory items this evening. Uh, we have two proclamations. Uh, we have an introduction of new employees couple of discussions regarding the possibility of a Bloomington sales tax, and then a report by the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, their 2022 work plan. Our consent business, I think we have 15 items. Councilmember Carter, you have the consent business tonight. Thank you for doing that. Under hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, uh, we'll be discussing a variance proposal for the Schmidt Music Sign. We've got three public hearings, one on a public pool and lodging code amendments. Uh, the second on the shared vehicle ordinance update, and then the third being a 2021 consolidated annual performance and evaluation report, our CAPER, and we'll be hearing from Erica Coleman from our HRA on that issue. Uh, item 4.5 is a motion to reconsider an ordinance that we amended, uh, that we adopted last week, which amend various chapters in the city code and uh, fee schedule appendix. Um, Councilmember D'Alessandro, you were ahead of the curve on this one and you saw that perhaps the numbers weren't right and they weren't. So we have corrected everything and we'll be uh, I'll, I'll making a motion to reconsider the previous adoption and then we'll make a motion to consider uh, the, the corrections that we have out there as well. Uh, under organizational business, we're going to be hearing from uh, Glenn Markegaard and some staff from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency regarding the uh, landfill down in Burnsville, and we will authorize also or ask the council to authorize a comment letter to the DMPCA regarding that, and then we'll finish up with our city council policy and issue update. Sounds like a busy meeting. Councilors, anything to add or any amendments to it? If not, I would move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. Motion and a second by Councilmember Lohman to adopt tonight's agenda. No questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0, and we have an agenda. And as I mentioned, our first item on the agenda is a proclamation. We have two proclamations, and the first item is proclamation declaring today, August 29th, or, yeah, August 29th, 2022, is Tony Oliva Day here in the city of Bloomington. Uh, as everybody here knows and everybody watching knows, uh, Tony Oliva, a longtime outstanding career with the Minnesota Twins, and a long overdue honor this summer to be elected to the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. And so we're very proud to be very happy for you. We're going to read the proclamation. I know we've got a video in back first that our staff has put together. So we're going to uh, roll the video, if you could, Grant, and then I'll head down to the dais to, uh, to read the proclamation. Minnesota is my home. I was born in Cuba. I love Cuba. I just think of Cuba every day. If I'm not in Cuba, I'm here in Minnesota. My first time I hear in Bloomington was in 1961 when I came from the ball club. I used to play in the Met Center. I love that area. I love all those people used to come in, especially in the weekend, and they interrogate the stadium, and so nice and everything. I live here permanent, permanent since 1968. And my family grew up here. All my kids, it's only about a mile or two. The father went as my my son, uh, Ricky, he's only about five miles away. <laughs> so it's nice to be living here in Bloomington. I had to go to Venezuela to see my brother. He was playing baseball in Venezuela from Cuba. When I was in Venezuela, my wife, Gordette, he said, honey, honey, you have to come home. I said, for what? I found the house. I found the right play, the chorus I could pay for for Pedro, for the family. I said, honey, I hear. I said, if you like the house, buy the house. And you know something? He bought the house. We agree, I don't saw the house first. But two couple of weeks later, when I came and saw the place, perfect. And we have the same neighbors 
for a long time. Wonderful people. That day that they called and said, you make it. You know, there was a lot of people here in the house. Those people was happy, bro, was happy and crying at the same time, you know. <laughs> that was beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. I never think, especially when, the, when I signed that someday I go be in Cooperstown or I go be, be Hall of Fame. It's, it's something that I don't think about. I contribute a lot to my attitude. I think I have a special attitude to help me to get through the other stuff because the, the people don't understand how hard it is for somebody to come from different countries who don't speak the language and know how nobody, how long so the same get, especially after the ball game and you come to the room. Or after the season's over, that everybody go home and you don't have no home to go. It's very hard. If you want to live a clean life, a good life, you have to follow the rules. I think that that is one thing the baseball do for me and do for everybody else. The best therapy in the world is to be professional. Any place I go, young, old, there's a lot of people, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, like me or all, they go out the way sometimes they see me in the store and see in the place they turn, congratulate you, congratulate you. I can't believe it. All those people was waiting for that moment. They loved me before, but now they have the opportunity to say, we did it as a team. We did it. The more important for me is to see how many thousands and thousands of people was waiting for that moment. The only thing I like to do, I like is keeping the people happy. If I can make the people happy, I happy. Thank you in advance for this opportunity. You know, I love Minnesota, I love Bloomington. As I said, uh, we don't often get an opportunity to, to congratulate and to recognize a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer here in the Bloomington City Council Chamber. So uh, forgive me if I miss a word or two as I'm trying to make sure that I get through this entire proclamation. Proclamation for Tony Oliva Day, August 29th, 2022. Whereas Bloomington resident Tony Oliva had a legendary career in Major League Baseball. And whereas Tony played his entire career with the Minnesota Twins from 1962 to 1976. And whereas, Oliva's 1964 rookie season earned him a near-unanimous Rookie of the Year selection, receiving 19 of 20 first-place votes. His 323 batting average made him the first player ever to win both the Rookie of the Year award and the American League batting title. And whereas, for his career, Tony O boasted a batting average of 304 with 220 home runs and 947 runs batted in. He had 1,917 hits in 1,676 games stole 86 bases, 444 walks, and only, only 645 strikeouts. He won the American League Rookie of the Year Award in 1964, the Gold Glove in 1966. He was a three-time American League batting champion in 64, 65, and 71, and was an eight-time All-Star. <clears throat> and whereas, Tony was inducted into the Minnesota Sports Hall of Fame in 1988 and the Minnesota Twins Hall of Fame in 2000, and whereas, Tony's uniform number six was officially retired by the Twins franchise on July 14, 1991. And whereas, after far, far too long of a wait, Tony was elected into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 2021 and was officially inducted on July 24, 2022, along with former twin Jim Cott, joining just four other Minnesota Twins, Armin Killebrew in 1984, Rod Carew in 1991, Kirby in 2001, and Burt Blylevin in 2011. And whereas, Tony has called Bloomington home since 1968. Now therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim August 29th, 2022 as Tony Oliva Day in the city of Bloomington, Minnesota. Signed this day, August 29th. So congratulations, Tony. Three things that I wanted to mention. The, um, uh, 
I enjoy taking my kids to games and, and going to Target Field and taking my nephews and so on. And every time I'm there, I point at the numbers, the retired numbers. And to see your number up there, along with players who have defined what it means to be a Minnesota twin, defined the excellence, defined uh, what it, it, uh, it all encompasses and what it feels like to be a twin, along with the number 42 up there, it always, we go through and we, I talk about each of those players and I always make sure we talk about you and, and your career very specifically. Uh, I also had to take a look because this caught my eye, the 19 of 20 first place votes in the rookie of the year voting. And I said, who got the 20th first place vote? <laughs> do, do, you, do you know? I think, uh, I believe a guy from Boston. It was. Uh, uh, that, uh, <coughs> no, 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 no. He got a great year, no? Uh, Canagdan. Tony Canagdan. I think he Canigler. got it. Yeah. Guy named, he got it because he got who I've never heard of before or since, yeah. Wally Bunker oh, oh, for the Orioles. Yeah. And as it. As a rookie, he went 19 and five, which is an outstanding season for a pitcher, a rookie pitcher. One first place vote in rookie of the year because of the work that you did. And also that year, that same year, uh, you finished fourth in the MVP voting behind three guys with last names of Robinson, Mantle, and Howard. Not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> Not bad at all. So it is uh, a great honor to, uh, to be able to present you with this proclamation for Tony Oliva Day. It is a great honor to have you as a representative of Bloomington, of Minnesota, of the Twins, and of baseball in general. And it's a great honor to welcome you here and thank you for being here today. So come on up. Why don't you come on up and say hello to everybody. Congratulations, thank you, thank sir. You, man. You're thank very you. welcome. Thank you. See the commission. Thank you for everything. For you guys, what you saw right here, they say everything already. This is the way I feel about Bloomington. The people, people of Bloomington, the people of Minnesota. And today, remember you said, today is the 29th of August. I can do anything I want now for the rest <laughs> of my life. That, that, I remember that, you know. Uh, that's, that, that's great, but uh, you know, Minnesota and Bloomington being very, very nice to me and my family. Um, I fell in love with Bloomington. Back the first time I touched Bloomington, the ballpark in 1961. But in 1964, I started playing regular. I met my honey here, Gordette, or even 1964. In 1968, we get married. And we bought a house in Bloomington small house, 8333 Portland Avenue. Was very close to the ball, Paul. I had to watch it because Kelly Bruce hit the ball so hard <laughs> that maybe can hit the roof of the house. <laughs> but only was about five minutes from the from the ball, Paul, about 10 minutes from the airport. The only bad thing was that road was very busy. And I was lucky. In 1964, I got a great years. My first few years, I have a great year in Minnesota. I live so convenient. Everybody knows where I was living. And pretty soon, people stop in the middle of the road and take a picture where I live. A lot of times, I was outside, you know, more the, the, the grass. I was doing something. And my little boy, Pedro, he was very busy. Later, you know, when, in 1980, when he was born in 1970, 71, he started running around. He liked to go across the street. And we decided to move from there. <laughs> uh, we said we had to make a move. But we don't want to move from Bloomington. We only moved to, to uh, 212 Spring Valley Drive. It's not only by a mile from here. Yeah. And now my daughter lives about four blocks from me. My son, Ricky, lives about two miles here. My grandkid uh, go to school in Kennedy and, and Jefferson. <laughs> All my son went, you know, everybody's here in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. Everybody's in Bloomington. And I have the best neighbor in the world. You know, we can be in Florida. If somebody is scratching the house, something we know. <laughs> you know, it's a nice people, nice neighborhood. Nice, it's good. Everybody is, 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 is wonderful here uh, for us in Bloomington. And, and we love Bloomington. I love Minnesota. 
Uh, they built a studio, a, a field here on my name, Tony, you know, uh, Tony O, number one field, and Drake Scott. Uh, I never believed something like that happened, but they happened. Uh, yeah, I love Minnesota. I live here. My family, I uh, love Minnesota, my friends, and, uh, and it's like a family. It's like a big family for us. When all those people get together, and uh, we were waiting for the moment that they called me for the Hall of Fame. Those, uh, you know, those people was crying. A lot of the people was crying, you know, and I don't know what to say. When they got the call, uh, I say, I, get, I want somebody out to get the call because I don't want to hear, you know, what they say, you make it. Because they say, look, if we call you, we will call you from this time to this time. Only was about three minutes to left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I say it's the last boss. If I know, you know, I'm 84 years old, and you don't can be here forever. But, but uh, you say, you know, if I don't make it this time, I don't think I'm gonna make it. But I was, you know, for some reason, I was thinking this time I'm gonna make it for you, you know. But if I don't make it, I think I've been in the Hall of Fame for 60 years anyway. Uh, if I don't make it, because you know, I have a lot of friends. I did most of stuff that I never think that I go do or I dream I come from Cuba, from, from, from the country, from, I grew up, you know, uh, planting tobacco field, corn field, uh, all these things. I never played that much baseball. I played, but I don't play that much uh, compared to the kids here in America and the way they play, the way they train, all the stuff. At what I had to learn to, work, to play the game Many times I don't have no, 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 no shoes to, to all gloves and that, but we play and we have a good time. And I can tell you, my son, you know, if I lie, he can say, no, Papa lie. <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was in Cuba. He was in Cuba in, seven, in 88, no, 89. He was about 10 or 12 years old. He get there, and those kids, you know, between the two houses, they said, Rick, Rick, let's go play. They don't have no gloves. They don't have no shoes. The, the ball they got is like a sort of round ball. They make it together from a cough and that. And they give it to, for a bat, they give him a stick. And Rick tried to hit on that stick. He don't, get, he don't get hit the ball. He said, Daddy, I don't know. Those kids may drive me crazy. They want to play, play, play. The next day in the morning, 8 o'clock, already he, they was looking for him. Let's go play, let's go play. But well, this is the way we learn the game, you know, and, and we love it. And you have the opportunity to come here to America and uh, yeah, see what happened. Uh, I wish I had more time to go to the park because we see those kids when, when, they, when they play. I got to see it, Ken Ho Beckfield. Uh, I spent a lot of time there because I love uh, watching the game. And the game is good, very good. I said, what? Good thing for the kid and for the grown up too. Uh, it's, it's a good experience. You have some good coaches. You have the people. The only one, the the only thing they want is the best for you. I help you. This is it. So I tell any parents or the kid take advantage and play if they have a chance to play and that because this is a good opportunity that you can do all your life and you go enjoy it uh, and. You, if you got a look and be like me, I look at those pictures, and I say, man, how good I look when I was young. <laughs> Gentle, you know, you're making me very happy to be here today. I see this beautiful crowd, you know, is watching and try to understand my English because I've been here 62 years. Yeah, I work hard for my English. I study and write and that, but still my English don't want to improve. <laughs> I don't know. She's my, now my wife. When I meet her, she don't speak any Spanish. She don't speak no English. The whole thing was what what. <laughs> Today she speaks Spanish better than me. I still don't speak English. You know. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stick around up here. Why don't we get everybody here up here for a picture? If we could, when we back off here just a little bit, so we get a that side or this side? On this side. side. All right. We'll go over here just a little bit. I'm gonna hand that to you, sir.
You're going to have to drag this We be in. Everybody good? Good. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And I know there's a lot of cookies left. Take care of Well, that was a first for us, I think. <laughs> Gotta like that. And I want to thank and recognize Denise for getting all the cookies and, and making everybody feel welcome and comfortable. Well done, thank you. We have a second proclamation tonight, not to make too jarring of a, of a switch here. Uh, but this is uh, for a, an important piece, uh, an important week and month that we have talked about in the past here in the city of Bloomington, and we wanted to make sure that we continue it as well, and especially tonight because the first week of September is an important week, and obviously we don't have a council meeting next Monday night because of Labor Day, so we wanted to make sure we got this in. And uh, this proclamation is, uh, as I said, for an important topic, an important issue, National Suicide Prevention Week and Month. And uh, I will read the proclamation now. National Suicide Prevention Week and Month, August 29, 2022. Whereas suicide is a major public health issue that requires vigilant attention and preventative action with 723 Minnesotans dying by suicide in 2020. And whereas each death by suicide directly impacts numerous family members, friends, loved ones, and by extension, the entire community. And whereas the city of Bloomington is committed to ensuring that those in need have access to services by healthcare providers trained in best practices to reduce suicide risk and to reducing the stigma associated with using behavioral tr health treatment or losing a loved one to suicide. And whereas the Bloomington Public Health Division is a member of the Hennepin County Community Health Improvement Partnership, which has identified mental health and well being as a priority for their 2019 2023 strategic plan. And whereas the City of Bloomington recognizes organizations such as Suicide Awareness Voices of Education, also known as SAVE, for their efforts in educating the public and providing services for those at risk. And whereas the month of September is recognized as Suicide Prevention Month, and September 4th through the 10th is recognized across the United States as Suicide Prevention Week. Now therefore I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim September as Suicide Prevention Month, and September 4th through the 10th as National Suicide Prevention Week in the city of Bloomington, Minnesota, and call upon the people of Bloomington to observe this month and week by working with your families, friends, neighbors, coworkers, and leaders to become more informed of mental health issues that contribute to suicide. Signed this day, the 29th of August, 2022. Now, I want to, uh, I I want to recognize and acknowledge our city staff members who have been personally affected by the loss of a loved one to suicide. And I want to thank them for their efforts to promote suicide prevention and reduce the stigma associated with suicide. I'd like to also to highlight a few res resources that are being promoted and amplified here tonight and in Bloomington because these are, are, are important uh, considering the topic and the, uh, the, the notion of Suicide Prevention Month. This year there's a new easy to remember three digit number for people in mental health crisis. That number is 988. Individuals anywhere in the country can call or text 988 and receive help. The National Council for Suicide Prevention has a campaign called Take Five to Save Lives, which encourages everyone to complete five action steps. The steps fall under the themes of learn, know, do, talk, and share. I invite you to visit their website, take5tosavelives.org, to get involved. That's take five, the numeral five, to save lives.org. And finally, last, watch for the several activities this month to shine a light on this critical issue, including messages on the digital signs at city facilities and lighting Civic Plaza in purple, which is the official color of suicide prevention. 
I'd like to welcome now SAVE representative Andrea Webb. Andrea works in the SAVE office located right here in Bloomington. I invite you up to say a few words, Andrea. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Here's the proclamation for you so we don't forget that. Thank you. Thank you for having us and thank you for the proclamation. It is, um, as you said, a very important issue in the world nowadays with suicides. Um, save if nobody, I'm not sure how many here have heard of our organization, but we have been around for 30 plus years, bringing awareness and prevention um, out there in the public, educating them about suicide prevention and mental health. Um, a couple things I just wanted to bring up, 2022 has been a big year for us. We um, were selected to hold the U.S. data sheets on suicide. So at save.org, anybody is able to access those uh, data slides, and we're the only organization to have that information posted on our website. So that was a big honor for us to be selected to carry those slides. Um, the second thing is our partnership with the crisis text line. As the mayor said, 988 is the new crisis number. Anybody, if they choose not to call that number and just want to text, they can text the word SAVE to 741741. And that, again, is a new partnership with us and the Crisis Text Line for people to know that SAVE and help is out there for them. Um, we've also got a new training online for uh, workplace employees in the workplace. And again, everything can be found at SAVE.org. That is our biggest resource out there. Um, it's a, again, a new program that we've developed that our executive directive has put together and it's uh, suicide prevention for the employees in the workplace. And just to give you some stats on suicide in 2020, there was almost 46,000 lives lost to suicide in every 11 minutes, somebody takes their lives and every 27 seconds, someone attempts in the U S to take their life. Uh, one in every five Americans will experience a mental health crisis, and approximately 20 million Americans live with a major depression, as well as 50 million live with an anxiety disorder. Anxiety is a number one mental health condition, and some people might not think that that's a mental health condition, but it is. So again, we thank the city of Bloomington, we thank you, Mayor, for bringing awareness to suicide prevention and letting people know that there is help out there. Again, our website is save.org, and if anybody has questions or needs help, please don't hesitate to reach out. Every life matters, and we're here to help save those lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your important work. Thank you very I much. Next up on our agenda is item 2.3, which is the introduction of new employees. And I think we have uh, a couple of different groups tonight. We have uh, a number of folks from uh, Bloomington Police and then Bloomington Public Works, which we always seem to have people from Public Works. They, we were always, always glad to greet the people from Public Works. So why don't we start with uh, our, our police employees. Uh, Chief Hodges, are you gonna do the introductions or? I think he had to step out. Oh, he stepped out. As I said, we'll start with Public Works. <laughs> Come on up, folks. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Scott Anderson from Good evening, Scott. Public Works Utilities. And with me tonight are four uh, new Public Works employees, three of which are in our maintenance group. All of those are in our street section, and one from uh, our utility division. Um, just really quick background, as you know, our, our street maintenance group, um, they're the ones who keep our streets plowed through all hours of the morning uh, and night in the wintertime. Um, they they um, implement the, the maintenance portion of our pavement management program, including seal coating, crack sealing, patching, uh, tree trimming, street sweeping, and stormwater maintenance, pond maintenance, um, in compliance with, with our permits and regulations of our uh, stormwater management program. So I'll introduce, I'll start with Justin Malika. Uh, Justin is from Jordan. Uh, he's married and has an 11-month-old daughter. Um, and 
one of the, uh, he has a, a barbecue food truck that he likes to operate locally and compete in barbecue competitions. Um, when he's not doing that, he also <laughs> enjoys uh, hunting and fishing. Justin, how's it going, everybody? Nice to meet you. <laughs> Glad to be here. Justin, you're you're my hero. <laughs> uh, I mentioned competitive barbecue once in our house, and it didn't go well at no. all. So, <laughs> it's, uh, so, welcome aboard. Glad to have Thank you. you. On. Appreciate it. Thanks. Justin touches off a theme with three out of the four uh, uh, people we have here tonight in terms of culinary skills, and <laughs> maybe they can touch on that if they'd like to. Secondly, uh, I've got Mark Hilgert, um, also in our street group. Um, he grew up um, and lives in Bloomington with his wife, and they enjoy ex exploring uh, our many parks and trails and the farmer's market on the weekend, um, and came to work. Uh, for the city after uh, working in the private building maintenance sector. Hi. Good, evening. Good, evening. Good evening. Welcome. I think there's some food skills there too, but maybe, he's, maybe he doesn't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I spent 10, 10, 12 years in the restaurant industry, oh. so that was a long time ago, though. <laughs> Public works, Welcome might, aboard. Public works might throw a party here there in you the go. near future. Uh, Ryan Young with Streets also grew up in Bloomington, graduated from Kennedy. Um, after that, he traveled the world, the world for 15 years as a pastry chef, uh, made a career change recently um, working in highway construction, um, <laughs> and came over, uh, came over to us from there. He still enjoys baking in his free time, which is good news for us. Um, and he's and he's happy to be back in Bloomington. Thanks for having us tonight. Thank you. Welcome, Brian. So, uh, the, the parallels baking and, and highway <laughs> maintenance. I'm just COVID career change. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, happy to be here. Well, good. Glad to have you. And lastly, we have uh, Peter Nelson, who's in utilities. And utilities, as you know, we uh, maintain our water distribution system, wastewater collection system, uh, produce water uh, out at our uh, water treatment plant. Um, Peter is father of three boys under three. Yep, I said three under three, so uh, he's plenty busy. Um, I, I should note, because he made a point, he's husband to a wonderful wife um, and recently moved to Bloomington. Uh, before coming to Bloomington, he worked for three years with the city of Minneapolis um, as part of their water distribution group, and he's currently enrolled in graduate school for a master's in uh, public administration. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Very good. Welcome. Uh, where, what, where, where are you studying? Uh, studying out of the University of South Dakota. Oh, great. Go Yos. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. And uh, Peter, Justin, Marcus, and Ryan, welcome. Glad to have you on board here with the City of Bloomington. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The chief is back in the room now. Uh, chief, if you could do the introductions for your new members of your staff, if you could, please. All right, so we got uh, four people here, uh, all in our dispatch center, uh, Natasha, Thomas, Olivia, and Joshua. So, uh, Natasha, you wanna go first? Sure. All right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Natasha. Um, I started with Bloomington back in May. Um, I came from healthcare, and I'm currently enrolled in um, school to get into the nursing program with a passion for forensic nursing. Very good. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Thomas Perhart. I come with uh, 11 years of 911 dispatching experience. First three were at Dakota County, uh, DCC. Um, 2008, I transferred over here to Bloomington and I was a dispatcher until 2016. Um, I'm very happy to be back. Um, as I told the chief last month, coming back is like coming home to family. So thank you very much. We're glad to have you back, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Olivia, um, starting dispatch. Uh, for this, I worked uh, three years for Scott County um, well, three and a half years, three years in the jail there, and then six months in Health and Human Services. Um, also, right now, I, I I live in Crystal and am on the um, fire department there, so I do that when I'm not here. Um, so, yeah, glad to be here. 
I'm glad to have you. Thank you. My name is Josh. Um, I was a reserve here for about three years, 2016 or 2017 through 2019. Left, finished my degree in criminal justice, came back. Um, I was a dispatcher for Alina in the meantime between then and got the uh, job opportunity here. So now I'm here and I'm happy to be here. So nice to meet all you people. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Uh, for all of you, I, I know you. It, it's a difficult job. I know that and appreciate your willingness to step up and take on the challenges that come with it and uh, to step in here in Bloomington because we know there has been a need here in Bloomington. We're very glad that you're on board and able to, to help us out and do what you can to keep our officers safe and get them to where they need to be in, in, in safety. So thank you so very much for being here this evening and welcome aboard to Bloomington. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mayor and City Council, I'll just be very brief. Um, this makes our dispatch center almost fully staffed. Um, we have 60 applicants for our position here, so that is a lot. So, um, yeah, I'm happy that they're here and looking forward to a fully staffed dispatch center in the next six months. So, thanks. Congratulations. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> Item 2.4 on our agenda is uh, an update, a report on uh, the 2020 Minnesota Department of Revenue sales tax uh, evaluation of the Bloomington sales tax proposal that we had talked about uh, within the past year or so here. I see Lori Economy Scholler coming forward to talk with us. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, on the telephone joining us tonight is Ryan Pesch. Ryan is uh, an extension educator in community economics from the University of Minnesota. Ryan uh, and the University uh, Extension Office has been engaged a number of times with the city. So most recently, uh, he has studied the 2020 information that um, and really will reflect the COVID impact. Um, the Department of Revenue will put the information out on their website for us to look at generally at the end of March. Uh, this year it was end of May. So the report um, just was finalized and he's here to talk about that. Um, so. Um, Ryan, if you'd like to join us. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, we're having a difficult time making the uh, making Ryan a presenter, so give us just one moment for a technical fix. Standing by. And through the magic of technology, we have uh, Ryan Pesh. Ryan, can you hear us? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ryan. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Okay, very good. Well, uh, thank, you. thank you all for having me. Uh, as Lori explained, I'm an um, extension educator at the University of Minnesota. And uh, since 2004, we've been working with the sales tax data primarily to give communities a scorecard about how their retail and service businesses are doing. For the last seven, eight years, uh, I've been doing work on local option sales tax analyses using that same, same data. Um, so I just thought I would uh, hit some of the, the, the main headlines for you that are in this report. I believe that it's in this packet before you. And also take a little bit of time to uh, go show you a little bit of the methodology so that all of you are comfortable with how I came about. Uh, this split between residents and non-residents, that is who would be paying the tax for uh, the local option sales tax. In case any of your constituents or, or others ask you about that, and I want you to feel comfortable about where the data came from. Um, so I'll show my screen here in, in just a second. Uh, but the first thing that I'd really like to emphasize is that this is good data. Um, this comes from the state sales tax database. And uh, so this is based on data reported by your businesses in the city of Bloomington, not a collection of your zip codes in the city of Bloomington, uh, who are responsible uh, for remitting sales tax. So it isn't one of these voluntary things to do, or there's very good compliance around sales tax. So uh, that's one first point I'd really like to make is this analysis is based on that state sales tax data that is, remitted by your businesses. 
So uh, let me pull up this one of my many screens that I have here. Let's take a look at the report that is in front of you in your packet. So a few, first a little bit of the headlines. Screen, folks. First, let's look at uh, figure two on page seven. Uh, this is total taxable sales as reported uh, uh, from the Department of Revenue going back to uh, 2008. Uh, when I've done these analyses in the past, I initially did one using 2016 data. I believe I did that in 2018. I've done two updates since as you guys track and think through what to do with the uh, local option sales tax. Um, and as Lori kind of presaged here, uh, certainly there was uh, a fairly steep drop in terms of total taxable sales, uh, a little more than 30% from 2019 to 2020. Uh, so certainly 2020 is our first year, our first pandemic year, and it certainly had uh, a significant impact in terms of total taxable sales. We just go down a little bit uh, down to figure five. Uh, this gives you a little bit of sense of how that impact of the pandemic uh, affected different types of businesses. Uh, sales tax data is broken out by different subcategories. So we can look at each of these subcategories and see the change. Um, and so I just sorted it in, in terms of the change from 2019 to 2020. Uh, furniture stores took a uh, just took off, if you will, <laughs> uh, more than 300% uh, percent more than the, the year previous. But there's also increases in some of these other goods uh, retailers, such as building materials uh, and food stores. And certainly, um, and this is a story across the entire nation as well as the entire state, a decrease in some of these service categories, certainly accommodations, health and personal uh, services and things like that. And so we see that uh, in, in figure five. Ryan, uh, if I could ask a quick question, uh, and I think sure. you, you, you answered it. With, is, what we saw in Bloomington here, I'm assuming this was at least on par or close to on par what was seen across the, the country or across the state of Minnesota. Is that true? Yes, it's true. It's, it's very much in keeping with what we saw in the national data as well as what you see in the stat, state data. Um, community by community, you can see different effects depending on the mix of businesses, you um, had a, a greater drop in terms of total taxable sales compared to the state, in large part because you have so many accommodations and so many service businesses, right? Uh, so all the hospitality was, was hit, whereas a lot of goods retail increased, right? I just did a report for Hermantown, for example, they really have no hotels <laughs> and not as much food service. They're just a bunch of big box stores. They actually ticked up a little bit in comparison to where they were previously. But yes, that is that that trend is very much in keeping and it's affected by the mix of businesses in your community. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. Very good. Um, so let me go down. This figure six just shows that difference. I split out the service businesses versus the retail businesses, um, our traditional goods selling retail businesses. And as you see there, your, your goods, uh, those retail only, those goods uh, retailing businesses really, really held their own, right? You see a fairly even, even bar there <laughs> from 19 to 20, and then a real precipitous drop in terms of those service businesses. So next, let's go down to figure 11. And this is where I break out. Uh, you can see my estimate, uh, which is what the, really the primary thing that I'm doing, is to break out um, between non-resident contribution to those taxable sales versus resident contribution to taxable sales. And you see there's a uh, just a comparison here between what we did using 2016 data and where we landed with 2020 data, right? So the headline is nearly three quarters of all taxable sales were contributed by non-residents using 2016 data.
and certainly just with these effects of the pandemic and the shifting of, of spending patterns and that some of businesses not operating at that time, that 2020 de data just were at uh, just 60%. So obviously that, that shifted things as well. And so what I'd like to do is show you just quickly uh, what I, how I come about with this non-resident estimate. Uh, so all of you understand, you understand the math, if you will. Um, so you should see my spreadsheet here. This is, this is always a dangerous thing showing a spreadsheet, folks, right? <laughs> Let me make this bring up. Get up to 150. Okay. So I just highlighted here furniture sales just because that really stood out in the 2020 data. And so uh, the way I'm doing this analysis is, is relatively straightforward. Um, if you see here in this row eight, what I do is I, I estimate a, a potential sales calculation based on the pattern of how people shop in the state of Minnesota, an index of income, and then simply the population of Bloomington. And so in this instance in furniture, I estimated that folks in Bloomington spend approximately 31 million in taxable sales in furniture. Now what we do is we compare, I compare that potential sales to the actual sales. And in this case, the actual sales were much, much greater than 31 million. They actually came in at 143 million in taxable sales uh, for 2020. And so what we do is I come down here so at a very minimum, approximately 78% of those sales, uh, I would say are coming from non-residents. And that's really the safest assumption with this, this, this data, right? In that th there, there's only two, two ways you could look at it. Either folks in Bloomington are spending something like eight times more than the average Minnesotans on furniture, or, um, hey, there's actually non-residents coming in and bringing these dollars into the city. Um, and I think the second one is the, the safer assumption. So at 78%, that would mean that 100% of all Bloomington resident spending is in Bloomington, which also I think is an unreasonable thing. So what we do is I adjust these numbers up until I get to what I think is a reasonable capture rate uh, for each of these categories. So having done some focus groups in the, in the metro area with a number of other communities, um, I've, I, I really have this sense that at least 30% of sales reasonably are leaving a community just simply because of the close proximity to other shopping centers and opportunities. So in this case with, uh, with furniture, they're being at a destination uh, center and you have really actually kind of stiff competition in terms of furniture just down the road in Edina with uh, 50th of France and cluster furniture there. I did drop this a little at 68% of Bloomington capture rate, uh, which would equate to about 85% of all the sales coming from non-residents. And so it's, what I simply do is I, I work down each of these subcategories in this way in order to get to uh, essentially what's presented in this table here, figure 11, that non-resident estimate uh, for 2020. And so um, that, any, any questions just kind of on, on the method or, or how, how I go about that? We do have a question, uh, Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is related to the fact that sales taxes are oftentimes uh, due based on the delivery location. So for the example of furniture, if you bought it from some, somewhere in Bloomington, they would pay state sales taxes, but they may also pay, if it was delivered to Edina, Hennepin County sales tax, or Minneapolis, it would be Hennepin County transit tax plus uh, Minneapolis sales tax. So how do you identify what would actually be taxable in Bloomington. Conversely, there's a lot of things that get, you know, purchased by residents in Bloomington that get shipped in here from other places that we would likely 
uh, be able to uh, have a Bloomington sales tax on. So I guess, how does that get factored into this analysis? So, yeah, these are very good points. Um, so one, going back to the data set, these are taxable sales that are reported by Bloomington businesses within the boundaries of Bloomington, right? So in some examples, um, if somebody's ordering, if any, anything's being picked up in a Bloomington at any of those facilities, yes, those would be subject to the local auction sales tax. Yes, those are reported as taxable sales in the city of Bloomington, right? Um, the, in terms of the, the total proceeds we would expect from the tax, there are, there are, there are um, say, businesses that may do business in the city of Bloomington that would be responsible for submitting a local option sales tax that are not in those existing businesses that are already located and reporting in Bloomington, right? So for example, this issue of, um, I ordered from a retailer, I live in Bloomington, I ordered from a retailer in Otsego for a new, you know, um, some type of appliance, they deliver and then set it up and then uh, I pay them. Uh, they are not Seago business, but actually would be responsible uh, for submitting a local option sales tax. So what I do is I go to the Department of Revenue and ask for their estimate of tax proceeds because they're able to look at some of these cross hauling issues, if you will, and actually take out some some taxable sales that are being reported in the city of Bloomington, but may not actually be subject to the tax, if you will. So um, and the second point is around uh, online sales. They certainly would be subject to local option sales tax. Um, and so, for example, any Bloomington resident buying directly from an Amazon, uh, that would be subject to a local option sales tax. Uh, yet at this point, those are those numbers are not represented here, um, and you really don't have a good sense of those numbers until the tax really comes online, and it's now being collected. Uh, and revenue doesn't have a good way of saying, yes, those are taxable sales, and we can put an estimate on them either. If that makes sense, um, does, does, does that answer? Does that give a little bit of the the lay of the land? <laughs> Uh, yes, it does. I appreciate that. As a business yep. that has had sales tax audits in the past, I'm familiar with how these things work. So I appreciate that explanation. Yeah, very good. And so if anything, especially with online sales, which certainly are growing and certainly grew a lot with the, the pandemic we saw in 2020, 2021, and more so, even more so now. Um, Ryan, we, we have another question, if I could oh, interrupt yeah, yeah. again. Sorry. Uh, Councilmember hey. D'Alessandro. Hi, Ryan. Nice to talk to you again. Um, the the follow-up, you may be getting to this, so I apologize if I interrupted with a question that you were about to address. But um, when we talked before, we talked about the the impact of online sales and how the uh, 25, 75, now 40, 60 shift might happen. Um, <clears throat> do you have, do you have uh, knowing that you uh, don't necessarily have uh, the ability to kind of reference that until it's uh, the tax itself is in place, ha do you have any... Um, city data from those who do currently collect local option sales tax that you can use as a proxy for that estimation? Um, well, no, no, nothing too exact that I would, I would want to be quoted in the city council saying, let's say. Um, what I do know from other communities that I have worked with is because of those online sales that are subject to the local option sales tax that when they do come online, they basically every single community that has instituted local option sales tax has seen uh, something greater than the proceeds that were initially estimated by revenue. So again, revenue is looking at this, this report um, that is produced by them much the same way as I'm looking at it and presenting it to you here. Um, and then they're taking out some things that they uh, basically wrinkles in the data that they, they feel wouldn't be subject to the local option sales tax, but they are not estimating those online sales. So 
Uh, I've heard anything, you know, from 10 to over 20 percent more than was initially estimated by the Department of Revenue. But you have to understand their situation there. They want to give you a sandbagged number and a reasonable number that is on the low end so that um, you're budgeting conservatively and in turn won't come back and say, you know, you guys gave us this high number and, and we are not seeing the proceeds that you had estimated us. Does that make sense? It, it does. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up to that. I think the, the question that I'm <clears throat> interested in is how online sales impacts the mix of resident versus non-resident. I understand that most likely total sales will be higher, but for example, we have an Ikea in the city of Bloomington. There, it would anybody who's picking up at the at the Ikea here in Bloomington would be subject to a Bloomington sales tax, right? Yeah, right. Um, how many people are buying who don't live in Bloomington and are paying that tax versus how many people who live in Bloomington and are paying that tax is one question. But then there's also the question of, I live in Bloomington, I bought from Amazon, but because I did my transaction in Bloomington, I'm subject to sales tax. And so there's a theory, I think, that for online sales, the mix of resident to non-resident will be flatter. And I'm just wondering if you have any data that can help us understand that. Yes, it, it, it will be flatter. Um, but the primary question is by how much, right? <laughs> yes, right. So, yeah. I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll forward to Lori a report. I can't dredge the numbers out of my head right now, but I, I did a report on the Amazon effect that looked at, uh, online sales for the state, if you will. Um, and in actuality, I'm, I'm, I was surprised it was, I think we're something more like 15%, but um, I, 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 would, I would estimate that, yeah, even, even bringing that in, into play, if you will, um, and you're looking at a more quote unquote normal year for the city of Bloomington, you're consistently right here at three quarters. So say if you, you three quarters non-resident, so if you're flattening this even by, I don't know, 10% or something, you're, you're still at, you know, 65%, 60 plus percent. I can't imagine that it would be any flatter than that. Uh, but I could certainly take the numbers I have for the state uh, for uh, non-store retail, those online sales, applied as an estimate to your um, your just total population and the spending for the total population for these retail services and actually put that and revise the report. I'll, I, I can give you a, an estimate of that, but I can't do it off the top of my head. I, I would have been impressed if you were just doing that off the top of your head. Thank you, sir. I appreciate well, I know, that. I guess <laughs> you don't want me to do it off the top of my head. Yes. C City manager, that would be great to follow up on. Thank you. Yep. All right, no questions at this point, onward. Great, and so um, I was just gonna hit the, in terms of, you know, we see in the executive summary, um, the, the headlines of total tax proceeds and the estimates of total tax proceeds. Um, I'm gonna go up, excuse me, I can't talk and move things at the same time. And total tax proceeds from uh, 11 million in total tax proceeds from when we initially did this with the 2016 data. What I put and wrote is a you know a minimum of 6.8 million total tax proceeds because a we don't have those online sales uh, in there or an estimate of those proceeds, and also we're looking at this funky 2020 data, which obviously impacted businesses in a way that. Uh, they probably were not impacted uh, even in a 2021 and certainly not representative of where businesses and their tax remitting are now. So uh, the last I would do is just put your view towards this uh, figure nine, which shows a much wider uh, forecast of total taxable sales just because of this sharp drop off in taxable sales from 19 to 20. 
uh, but from the previous report, that was a much smaller band in terms of an estimate in terms of the upper and lower bound, simply because we had this weird dip. Um, so again, it'd be interesting to see where we end up with, with uh, actual 2021 data in terms of how things rebounded and uh, estimating these, uh, these tax proceeds going forward. So I'll leave it at that. And if I could, as I look, I'm, I'm doubling back with our, the information you had there. I'm, I'm looking at your, your forecast for 21, 22, 23, discounting 20 because it was an outlier. Uh, just wondering, as I double back here again, where this falls in terms of what we had in 2018 and 2019. This is. Yes, your, uh, your upper bound wasn't too different. Right, it was uh, slightly slightly higher, um, but you can almost take that same dotted line. I wish I had that report here to pull up in front of you. Um, you just had this much lower lower bound, which you know the, the lower bounds here at one point four million. I mean, I think the lower bound was something like two million. <laughs> right, so you had a lower bound of two million, an upper bound of two point five million. And, and the that yellow line that went in between. And, and I'm sorry, as I, as I try and toggle back and forth here. So the forecast for 21, 22, 23, where do they compare to what we actually saw in 2019, 18 and 19? The upper bounds were pretty much the same. Here, I, can, I should just pull up this report. I'm joining you from a hotel room in White Bear Lake. Let's see if this is yeah, on my left, <laughs> on my desktop. I don't have that here. All right, un understood. And I don't mean to have you dig through all of your old files and try and find find that, but uh, uh, just in terms of follow-up, that might be something that I'd be curious on. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge? I was just going to say we'll follow up and get that information. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Council, any questions? Ryan, was there was that the uh, the conclusion of your presentation? Was there, there more to add? There, there really is no more to add. I'm happy to entertain any other questions. Get out of WebEx so I stop showing my screen to you here. Um, Ryan, before you stop showing your screen, could yes. you could you show them the the city council the estimates that you have um, for the future? Oh, yeah, I think that's what I was initially. These estimates right here. Uh, the following screen, I believe, or graph. Oh, where's my graph? Oh, yes. Uh, yep, there we go. So there's 21, and then I think you make a forecast. Sh should we implement in the future what that might look like? There we go. Yes, yes, yes. That was basically the information I was wondering, so thank you for that. Yep. But those, that 21, 22, and 23 was a much tighter band based on that 2019 data. Got it. Right? So when you're extrapolating, it's just it's basically doing a running mean and then mm -hmm. you get this weird 2020 data that makes for a wider band. I'm understood. Yep. Council questions on this? Comments? All right. Well, uh, appreciate the information, Ryan. Appreciate uh, the work and the your ability to be flexible with this because I know that 2020 was such an outlier that it, it it makes your job even more difficult to try and make those estimates, those upper and lower band estimates, because because of how weird 2020 was. It was just so completely outrageous that we've not seen anything like that. So I appreciate the work that you put into making sense of it all. Very good. We're trying. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Anything else, Lori? Mayor and Council, I just wanted to show you a, a, on lodging sales tax, just some history and where, where we ended 21 um, on comparison on, on that. So Mike will pull up that PowerPoint, or the, the piece, if you could just go the next screen. Just reminding the council that th they had seen this data on where the occupancy rates have been and that the committee still meets at least monthly on this to look at that and that based off of where occupancy rates are currently, we did add more dollars to the sales, uh, lodging sales tax revenue for the general fund and that was in the levy information. We continue to watch that. Uh, again, it was 74% um, occupancy last week, so good news on that. So the next slide, again, Kari had showed you this um, and this is just um, month by month um, comparison, you can see how it's flowing on that. But on an year by year basis, the next slide will show you from kind of 2015 to now where the budget line was in blue and where the actuals were. And so, as Ryan mentioned, the state's conservative in their estimates, and uh, generally when we do a revenue budget or, or um, your revenues should be on the conservative side because you want to know you're going to make it, except when COVID hits. Um, and expenditures, you want to spend under that. So you do see the fluctuation where actuals are coming in ahead of schedule. Um, even for 22, currently we're estimating a, a couple hundred thousand greater than budget. And you can see that 2020 number exactly the, what Ryan had shown, that 69% decrease. That's that little orange bar in 2020. <laughs> but 2021, I mean, it almost doubled what we received there. Mm -hmm. and, and the consistent uh, budget being less than the actual or estimated, that's, that's the result of conservative estimates and budgeting that... Uh, I would say conservative, but still reasonable. Conservative. I mean, they're, they're, yes. they're not... I mean, other, otherwise, you'd see real mm -hmm. fluctuations there, but... Um, it's good to know. So just providing more data. Good, thank Should you. there be other questions, um, Ryan will update the information and provide that to us, and then we'll send it out through one weekly. Thank you. Council, any questions, additional questions? Thank you. Ryan, if you're still with us, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Take care. Absolutely. On to item 2.5 on our agenda, uh, an update on a survey done regarding the Bloomington sales tax. Um, a, a report, and I know this was uh, commissioned just to kind of get a better feel or an understanding of where the community was regarding the Bloomington sales tax. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. As the Mayor indicated, uh, as we continue forward on this exploration of the possibility of a, a local option sales tax, we thought it was a good time to gauge uh, you know, awareness and sentiment in the community. Uh, as, as the council is aware and, and to again share with folks who are watching, we had a request at the legislature during the 2022 session, uh, our uh, request to get legislative approval to move forward on a sales tax was in both the House and the Senate tax bills. And unfortunately, uh, the legislature was not able to come to an agreement with the governor and complete its work. There was no tax bill. Uh, so the, the process is that the legislature grants approval to the city to ask its residents for approval. So the legislature was the first step. Uh, I anticipate that we will be discussing this when we're putting together our platform for the 2023 legislative session. And we thought as we continue our communications with the community, it would be a good, uh, good time to uh, uh, see where residents are at on these issues. Uh, and we brought in Mr. Leatherman from the Morris Leatherman Company uh, to do that work for us. So without uh, getting into the details, he's the expert. We'll let him tell it. Good evening, Mr. Leatherman. Welcome back. Super. Good to see you again. Pleasure to be here with you this evening uh, to go through the survey. And uh, this is a consolidated, a, a high-level look at some of the key questions of the survey instead of it was approximately 40 or 50 questions. But for the purpose of this, we thought we'd just pull out seven or eight of the, the key questions of the survey. To review with everybody what we did for the city, we spoke with 400 randomly selected residents across the community. The interviews were conducted between July 27th and August 11th. Um, 400 
sample, the margin of error is always plus or minus 5% in 95 out of 100 cases. The, the, the margin of error is based on the size of the sample, not the percent of the population. So a 400 sample in Bloomington, a 400 sample of Hennepin County or the state of Minnesota is plus or minus 5%. Average completion time was 10 minutes. Non-response rate was 5.5%. And I always put up some demographics so you can see the profile of the sample. Uh, cell phone only households, they were a majority this time, 52%. Uh, landline only households, so, you know, my 21 year old son doesn't believe they exist, but they do exist. Uh, they're 11% of the population. And then both landline and cell phones were 37% of the population. If we continue with the, the demographics, slowly, so we slowly build to the next chair. <laughs> this one's not that exciting to build to. <laughs> <laughs> the first the first set of bars looks at how long the typical resident has been in the community. You come in just under 10 years, the typical resident. 24% have been in the city for less than uh, t five years, 29% for over 20 years. So you almost have a one-for-one -one mix, what we call the newbies and the settlers in the community. The median uh, age of the respondent is about 46 years old. 26% are between 18 and 34 years old, while 40% are over the age of 55. 28% each contain children and seniors, perfectly balanced in the community. Uh, Male-female split was 50-50. And the financially stressed question, we obviously ask this question whenever we're talking about any sort of tax increase. And this question asks folks to think about their income and their expenses and how they're matching up. Is income exceeding expenses or vice versa? Um, this is pretty much the trend now we've seen uh, over the past, uh, well, the pandemic. This It's yo-yoed all over the place. Before the pandemic, way back when, uh, the norm was about 30% saying they were financially stressed. The pandemic, we, we got up to a high during the pandemic on the second government shutdown by Governor Walls, right between around Thanksgiving when that happened, where it got to about 54% in the metro area indicating they were financially stressed. Over 2021, it decreased back down. We were in the low 30s at the start of this year. Now what we've seen with inflation, cost of gas, everything going on, we're now in the 40 to 44% range. Now it really has, we have a statewide in the field right now, be curious to see, uh, we have a sense that as gas prices are coming down, this might have stabilized, that we're not gonna go to the majority, uh, but pretty typical for what we see right now with in the low 40s indicating that their expenses are exceeding their income currently. If we continue with the next set of demographics, 29% indicated they were renters. The median household home value, now this is self-assessed, um, so people are mu always much more optimistic, comes in at about 320,000. Democrats outnumbered Republicans by 6% in the city, with 18% indicating they were independent. Uh, conservatives were 39%, liberals 32%, and 28% moderates. And then the last set of demographics, I'm sorry, that was less than demographics. Perfect. All right. So that's the profile of the sample. One, we asked a couple questions up front just to see how folks were feeling about the community. And the first one is simply, how would you rate the quality of life in the city of Bloomington? Uh, this time, 92% rated it favorably, 8% rated it unfavorably. Now, most people live in a community where you have at least 85 to 90% indicating it's excellent or good. If you live in a community you think is only fair or poor, you're probably going to be looking for a new city to move to pretty soon. What differentiates community is the excellent rating. Because Minnesotans aren't very enthusiastic oftentimes. Oftentimes good is good enough. So before the pandemic, the norm on the excellent rating was just under 20%, about 18 or 19%. The pandemic has made people less enthusiastic about everything. The median excellent rating now is 11%. It's been cut in half. They haven't gone only fair or poor. They've just gone to good. Quite frankly, a lot of it was spent the first eight, nine months where everybody was really living in the community that they actually lived in instead of leaving it. They found a lot more to be unhappy about. Potholes, neighborhoods, you know, neighborhood homes, those sorts of things. So relatively compared, you're more than twice the excellent rating that we're typically seeing over the past two years of the pandemic. So strong quality of life rating. If we go to the next slide, 
how do people think about the value of their city services? Now, this is kind of the, where the rubber hits the road question. We ask folks to think about the property taxes they pay and the city services they receive. How do they rate that value? This time, 73% rate the value favorably, 20% rate it unfavorably. This one, we always look at at a ratio. Uh, because it depends, some, you take out the uncertainty. So we're at, we're at 73 to 20, it's better than three and a half to one. The norm ratio on this is two to one, positive to negative. So you're 50% higher with more people indicating that they are receiving a positive value for the amount of taxes. This takes into consideration even if folk, folks think their taxes are high. They can still say, yes, but I'm getting a good value. So the city nets out very favorably if we look at the overall quality of life and the value of city services. If we go to the next slide, let's focus in on parks and rec now. Now we went through a list and we asked them a two-part question. The first part was, do you or members of your household use this park rec uh, park uh, recreational amenity or facility. So what's a rate up here are those that indicate they use it. That's why it's not at 100%. So neighborhood parks, 82% of the community said they are members of their household use it. If they used it, how do they rate the facility? Excellent or good, only fair or poor, blue versus red. So indicating if we look at neighborhood parks, if we normalize it, which means take out the uncertainty and look at the percent that are willing to give a rating of the facility, it's better than 90% on neighborhood parks. On ball fields, 47% indicate that they use it. The favorable rating is approximately 92%. Trails, 85% of the community is using them. The, the normalized rating is about 94%. The ice garden, you can see there's much less usage, not surprisingly. You have 39% indicated that they use it, but you can also see those that use it, almost 25% rate it only fair or poor. So there is an awareness amongst the users of the potential needs at the ice garden that's being discussed with the half cent, uh, sales tax option. Creekside Community Center, 45% of the community uses it, normalized to about 94%. The Center for Performing Arts, 54% use it, it's approaching 95% favorable. The Aquatic sim uh, Center, very similar to the Performing Arts. And then Dwan Golf Course, 43% indicate they use it, approximately 80%. So the two real specific facilities being discussed for the half cent, the Ice Garden and Dwan, they have lower usage, but then also amongst those users, they do have the highest amount of unfavorable rating at approximately 20 and 25%. If we go to the next slide then, we went through all four items being discussed for the potential uses of the half cent tails at sales tax increase. And what's arrayed on the chart is the support and the opposition, but I also wanted to put up intensity. So the dark blue is the strong support, dark red is strong opposition. The highest support is for the new health and wellness center. And we did describe them specifically, and this is the construction of a new health and wellness center to provide recreation, education, and fitness programming. 76% indicate that they support it, 22% oppose it. If we look at intensity, it's four to one in favor of strong support. The next highest level of support is for the expansion of the Bloomington Center for Arts, including a new concert hall and rehearsal space. 72% support, 27% opposed, strong support to strong opposition, five to one in favor of that. Uh, the, the third ranking is the improvements to the Dwan Golf Course, including a new clubhouse, 62 to 33. Uh, two to one, strong support to strong favorability. And then the lowest, but it is still a majority, is the renovation of the Bloomington Ice Garden, including roofs, mechanical systems, ADA accessibility, and new training areas and locker rooms. 58% support, 35% opposed, about two and a half to one strong support versus strong opposition. All four have support by major by, uh, with majorities in the community, two of them extraordinarily strong support approaching three quarters and if you look though at that intensity on each of them even the ones that have lower support there's not a lot of strong opposition that strong opposition is between seven and fifteen percent okay so if it was on the ballot this November if the legislature would have taken action it would have been a very good chance that all four would have passed um, all things being equal we did then for the purpose of this presentation 
we went through a series of statements and asked, does it make you much more likely, somewhat more likely, less likely, or much less likely, or does it make no difference in your support? The one we pulled out simply because of the presentation before was the statement, a sales tax increase would not only capture sales tax from city residents, but also from people outside the city who make purchases in Bloomington. A University of Minnesota study projected 75% of the new sales tax revenue would come from people who live outside of the city of Bloomington. So we had to use a 2016 number since we didn't have the 2020 number at this point. And you can see the impact. And we've seen this when we've done other sales tax option or option for local sales tax for other communities is a very powerful argument for, for residents to understand that there's going to be money that's going to be brought into the city from people that don't live here. In your case, 67% indicate it makes them at least somewhat more likely to support, a third much more likely to support. 8% said it makes them somewhat less or much less likely, 24% no difference. Now the one thing I would point out is I did look at those four options that we laid out and we'll overlaid it with those that said it makes them at least somewhat more likely. The two that it has the most impact on are the two that have the lowest levels of support, the Ice Garden and Dwan Golf Course. Uh, it actually increases support for the Ice Garden. That argument is effective. It, you have 5% more people saying, yeah, that makes me more likely to support. On the golf course, it's 4%. The other two are at such high levels uh, of support at over 70%, it's going to be hard to kind of push beyond that. So. That's the, uh, the summary of the, the short version of the survey. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, thank you, Mr. Leatherman. Appreciate it. Appreciate the uh, information and the, uh, the work that went into this because I know it's, it's never a small task when you're trying to contact 400 people in the middle of the summer to get them to spend 10 minutes on the phone with you. So, it, When we're talking cities and school districts, it's very easy. When we're talking about the St. Paul legislature or the Washington, D.C., it's much more difficult. A little more trouble. There. Yes. <laughs> Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Loman. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you. It's good good data and I appreciate it. Just as a not not to ask you to do a remedial statistics class here for the folks that are watching or for me, um, what what is the significance of of the number four hundred as your sample size versus two thousand or twenty, for example? That's it, and it, it the with statistics, the sample size, as long as it's a random sample, that it's the N that matters. So the 400 always plus or minus 5%. If we want to go to plus or minus 4%, you go to 625. Now, I can't justify to a client to say you need to pay 50% more to get an additional point in the margin of error. It, it, do, it doesn't make sense with this sort of survey. To go to plus or minus 3, it's 1,113. Um, and it would be the same, and that's why Gallup, when they do a nationwide poll, it's 1,113 across the country. It'd be plus or minus 3%. If we did 1,113 in Bloomington, it's plus or minus 3%. It's just the statistical model, as long as it's a random sample where every, you know, when you have, you include cell phones and landlines in the mix, everybody has an equal chance of being included. Please. Real quick follow-up question, if that's okay. Um, when you say random sample, can you describe how you randomize your sampling? Yep. The, uh, on uh, landlines, it's um, random digit dialing still. And on, with cell phones, we purchase lists, and then we do a mix because I can, I can see how many uh, households in the community are cell phone only, how many have landlines, and what that mix is. So I established, I, I put those together and then randomly select out. And then I also, as we're going through the sample, part of the reason for the demographics, it's not only interesting to see you know, how households with children feel versus households with seniors, those sorts of things, but it's also to validate the sample against updated, the, now that we finally have the 2020 census. So I can look and see, okay, what's the proper percentage? Are we within that plus or minus 5% of households with children, of renters, and those sorts of things? Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first off, thank you for the analysis. Uh, excellent, uh, uh, excellent work there. Fun to read through. Uh, two quick questions for you. So with the no difference, I think you had it on questions uh, 38, 40, and 41, yep. there's a number of other ones. Did you probe at all into the, the no difference as to why uh, those folks? Was there any additional uh, questions in terms of that at all? We did just not, curious about no, we did not follow about. up on the no difference. No. Okay. Um, and then um, my, my last question for you is in terms of the overall results, were those representative um, 
uh, of each of the four different districts or wards, as you uh, kind of had it written in there? Yes, the wards are, were, I did, so a ward, if we look at, uh, this one I look at registered voters. Uh, so actually what I did, I did a little bit of reweighting because I wanted 100 in each of the wards, mm -hmm. but then I reweighted the data. So Ward 1 is 25%, Ward 2 is 27%, Ward 3 is 27%, and Ward 4 was 22%. When we looked at registered voter numbers. And so then I, I get that, the breakdown, but but those results, though, we'd find they'd be pretty representative, though, for each one of the questions that were asked. Sorry, I, I, that was actually, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> from a statistical standpoint, I understand why you answered that way. Uh, but... Uh, uh, but the results we'd find, those would be pretty representative overall within each of those districts? Yes. Okay. Now, with e within each of the districts, when you get down to that cell size, so basically your cell size, the N is 100. Mm -hmm. So now your margin of error is plus or, ten, plus or minus 10%. Uh -huh. So what I'm willing to do, you know, and I'll, I'll, we'll put this in the report, we'll look at statistically significant differences between the wards, but to come out and say <coughs> ward one, 70% feel this way and 30% feel that way with a margin of error plus or minus 10%. I'm willing to look at statistically significant differences, but not say it's a representative sample to say this is how Ward 1 feels with that level of margin of error. I appreciate that. Yeah. It just, it's just interesting to me in terms Absolutely. of that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, for clarification, when he's saying Ward, he's saying districts, basically. So if, if anybody's confused about that in any way. Councilmember Coulter. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, just, again, I'm going to try and avoid the sort of statistics 101 here, but, um, you know, I, I sort of took the top line numbers here. When we talk about, for example, support for the ice garden, roughly 58% support it, 35% oppose, and so on. Um, Health and Wellness Center at 76, 22, and so on. I'm, I'm wondering if just sort of, I, I think one of the most common questions we get, particularly when it's a poll, which is what this basically is, um, one of the more common concerns we get is, well, we know polls are sometimes wrong. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit. I mean, <laughs> what what sort of order of magnitude would your data have to be off in order for these numbers to be, say, reversed? Or, you know, if I mean, if something's ahead by 54 points and it turns out to be tied, what kind of, you know, what kind of order of magnitude of error are we talking about here? It, it would be, well, it, because there's always a caveat, plus or minus 5% in 95 out of 100 cases. So it would be a 1 in 20 magnitude of it being wrong. And in the one of the ways we ensure that it's not going to be, I mean, it would be, be more than a 1 in 20 shot simply because the demographics match up. Um, I, I could sit here for hours on the disservice that national pollsters have done and what they put out as a random sample uh, when we are mixing online surveys, you're mixing mail-in surveys, you have all these intrinsic biases that you can simply not have a margin of error. And then you do have um, folks even that do telephone surveys that simply call as many people as they can in two nights and then reweight the entire sample, saying simply if I have demographics that match, with the people who answered the phone, there's no differences in behavior. And that's why it does take us, you can see the, the field work was two weeks. Um, we're going to make appointments for people. We're going to make it easy for them to respond because I don't want to do a replacement on somebody simply because, I mean, I could call this sample in two nights. It would be 80% over the age of 55. It would be 70% female. Uh, it would be you have about 30% renters, it'd be probably be 5% renters, and then you sit here and re-weight, and you're saying that a person who's over 55 who's at home, the certain night you're calling, and is the same as a person who's 55 who's active. And that's what we just don't do. So it's a one in 20 shot that it's completely off. Um, Bill and I have never been able to quantify the fact, um, but if, if it, it's, it's one in 20 and greater than. Thank you. And while I would be interested in an hours long seminar, we perhaps we could. have <laughs> business to attend to tonight. Yes. Um, the last question I have, just honestly, because I'm more curious than anything else, this 8% who said that knowing that 75% of the revenue would come from outside of the city makes them less likely to support it. Do you, do you have any insight into that? Understanding that it's 8% of the sample, so it's an extremely small sample size. It, it is. I mean, it is. And we don't do a follow up. 
uh, on it. When we have asked before, it typically is in that 5 to 10%. Um, if it ever got larger, it would warrant a follow-up. I mean, I would hypothesize that it has something to do with parochial. Uh, this is our city. We'll take care of our city. But I don't have any data to say that. If it did get to 20 or 25%, we'd absolutely have to follow up because it is, in a sense, counterintuitive. Um, in, in especially when you're saying it's coming from outside. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything additional, Council? Mr. Leatherman, just kind of in general, how, how would you characterize the results of this survey about how people are feeling in this community right now? I mean, we did not do the larger overall quality of life. We looked at the smaller, you know, upfront portions and everything. But in comparison to other communities over the course of the pandemic, folks are very positive here. There's, there's, there's more enthusiasm here uh, for the overall quality of life, you know, by more than double um, on that. Um, and then that value of city services. Because in a time where you have more people indicating that they're financially stressed, Okay, that goes into the makeup of expenses and income and how they're matching and, and everything. And that's why that three and a half to one ratio on that value of city services is extraordinarily strong also. Good to know. Thank you. Super. Well, thanks for being here Pleasure. tonight. Thank uh, you. I, I wish the big crowd would have stuck around for your presentation. <laughs> I, I'm not Tony O. You're not Tony I'm O. I'm not Tony O. <laughs> I, I smiled like a little schoolboy when I came in and saw him there. That was awesome. So thank you for that yes. thrill tonight, too. Great. Thank you. Thanks Pleasure. for being here. Our final item under introductory is um, a 2022 work plan update for our office, the office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And we have uh, Faith Jackson, uh, I think... Dao Yang is going to get there. There she is. And I think Mike is going to join in where he can as well. Very good. Yes, we have the dream team tonight. Dream team. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight. Awesome. And I, and I wish the crowd had stayed here for you as well, but uh, you're not Tony O either. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, you all know me, but for the pleasure of those who may be watching at home who do not, I am Faith Jackson, the city's chief equity and inclusion officer, and I will be joined in my presentation tonight by equity and program specialist Padal Yang and also assistant city manager Mike Sable. So uh, tonight we're going to spend about 35 to 40 minutes with you, maybe able to bring that down a little bit, um, just sort of giving you an update on where we are with the 2022 work plan. And so, um, Mike, if you move along to the next slide, there's some information here about the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. So again, just a little bit of a reminder for those who may be hearing this information for the first time about what we do and how we do it. Uh, the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, it really sustains the equity inclusion work uh, for the organization, and it's our job uh, to embed equity inclusion through all, all of the systems, pardon me, the organization's policies, practices, systems, and all the things that we do. Um, and we do that within the framework of the Racial Equity Business Plan, which was adopted by the council in 2020, and also the city's Racial Equity Strategic Plan, which was adopted by the council in 2021. And so tonight's presentation will cover uh, the word that stems from the Racial Equity Business Plan. So in the next slide, I provide for you just a uh, brief reminder of what was included in that racial equity business plan. When you see it on the screen like this, it looks like a lot. Uh, we committed to doing a lot of things. Uh, but back in 2020, the council adopted the racial equity business plan. Uh, the commitments uh, from that plan are codified here on the screen. I won't go through all of them, um, but also this information is found on the city's website. And so back in 2020, we identified our values, uh, we identified some action items, and then we also decided uh, at that point what were the indicators of progress that we would look to. So tonight's presentation will uh, provide sort of an update on how we are implementing those action items, what are we doing, uh, and also we will share with you some of the information about where we're making progress. Um, so with that, I will get started. Uh, again, we're going to go through the four key areas of the racial equity business plan, uh, which include workforce diversity, inclusive culture, equitable programs and services, and authentic community engagement. 
Um, and then we'll have an opportunity for you to engage in conversation with us uh, with a little bit of a focused conversation around the design of the Welcome to Bloomington program. Um, another thing to note is that this presentation is comprehensive, hence the 40 minutes, uh, but certainly not exhaustive, right? So there's a lot of different things that we will not cover tonight. And if, they, if you have questions about something that we don't cover, like a particular project or initiative, feel free to reach out to us and we can provide an update via the one weekly. Um, and then lastly, please do share questions that you have throughout. So with that, um, and partially because Mike has already transitioned me, <laughs> I'll get started with workforce diversity, our 2022 highlights. And so the highlights here really speak to uh, things that we're doing to uh, sustain our inclusive recruitment work, uh, the supervisor toolkit and training, and also the Bloom and Bloomington summer internship. So here on the screen, you see some indicators of progress for the work that we're doing to be really innovative about our uh, recruitment for our new positions within the city of Bloomington. So back in 2020, the summer of 2020, we adopted some innovative recruitment strategies, uh, and we're happy to report that those strategies have really yielded some progress. And so we wanted to be intentional about creating systems change and transforming the way that our human resources department really advertised positions and also how we were able to attract uh, individuals to the city of Bloomington's organization. So what you see on the screen before you is some data that provides sort of a snapshot of all the new full-time hires who identified as something other than white and codified here as BIPOC. And so um, on the left, you'll see some circles and some inner rings and outer rings. Those inner rings are for the year 2019, and they progress all the way to the year 2022. Uh, and you can see where those colors, the green and yellow and red, expand. Uh, that is the increase in the number of BIPOC employees who've been hired over the years, um, BIPOC full-time new hires. Uh, the other uh, image that you see here on the right side of the screen really sort of provides an example uh, in a line graph here of how that percentage has changed over time. So I will compare 2019 and 2021. Um, well, because 2020 was 2020, so <laughs> there wasn't a lot of hiring in 2020. Uh, but in 2019, we see that the within that group of new full-time hires, uh, about 21% of those identified as BIPOC. Uh, after, the, after the implementation of our innovative recruitment strategies in 2021, we see that number increase to 30%. So about a 10% increase uh, after implementing those strategies. Uh, and it looks like that, that increase will continue into 2022. So we're really excited about that. Uh, the next thing that I will talk to you about, pardon me, <coughs> It's the city's Bloom and Bloomington internship program. And so this is something that I'm really excited about, and not just because there's these really cute pictures on the screen, um, because this is an opportunity for us to not only think about how do we attract current people in the workforce to the city of Bloomington, but how do we start to grow that future and emerging workforce. And so back in 2022, at the beginning of this year, uh, the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, although it wasn't an office at that time, uh, decided that creating an internship program would be on our 2022 priority list. Uh, similarly, at the same time, community development was their racial equity action team had a desire to develop a formal internship program. We were focusing more on graduate students and college students, and they had high school students in mind. And so what we decided is that we would team up in our efforts. And so I partnered with my colleague, Carla Henderson, uh, and we are going to have a shared initiative to develop a internship program for the city of Bloomington. Uh, Carla has some connections with Critice O'Neill, who leads the workforce development work in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center. They have the Bro Brooklyn program, which you may be familiar with. Uh, and so we were able to glean from her expertise uh, and get some guiding advice about how we could start our own program here in Bloomington. Uh, we presented this information to our city staff, our executive leadership team, and our division leadership team, and also some REAP members, and they were really excited about it and see this as a great resource to the city of Bloomington. And so with that, we have started to work to develop a formal internship program, and fingers crossed, we hope to launch that in 2023. Um, 
In addition, we wanted to take that one step further, right? So thinking about, okay, the internship will help us sort of build people into that pipeline, uh, but also recognizing that there may be other issues that we should address with the workforce development. And so this is work that has been led by the community development part department that we're partnering with. Um, and what our staff has been hearing is that employers, uh, they need more training uh, and recruitment and retaining talent and need more training to do that. And then also employees need help preparing for higher paying jobs. And so uh, we, in partnership with the community development department, we're working with the mayor uh, to convene a mayor's round table on workforce development. Um, and this will be a strategic partnership between businesses, nonprofits, and educational institutions. Uh, and the goal here is to really bring people together to think about what are those solutions that uh, we can think of, uh, brainstorm in order to address both current and those emerging workforce needs. And so the first meeting for that group is scheduled at the end of September. Uh, and if this is piquing your interest and you would like to learn more about it, please reach out to the mayor or reach out to our office and we'll get you an invitation to that meeting. And so with that, I get an opportunity to take a break and I'm gonna turn <laughs> it over to Mike Sable to lead us into the discussion related to the Inclusive Culture 2022 highlights. Uh, thank you, Faith, uh, Mayor and Council Members, Mike Sable, uh, Assistant City Manager. Uh, it's, I'm really uh, fortunate to, to work with this dynamic team, and so I really want to focus on kind of three areas that we've um, made additional steps to create an inclusive culture within the organization and within Bloomington. Uh, one of them is the creation of employee resource groups which is a leading practice among uh, large firms, and, and Bloomington is now dipping its toe and starting that, and we can, we're proud to announce that we have our first uh, ERG, and we have six more uh, in, in the pipeline. Uh, in addition, we've uh, revamped our learning and training and development uh, to really focus on cultural agility. Um, as the workforce changes, the needs and skills of, and as our residents change and our workforce changes, the skills of our employees need to change with it until we are more culturally agile so we can better serve the community that's ever changing. And then lastly, um, doing a, a sort of a, right, this is apparently the night for surveys, but we did an inclusive culture survey within the organization to get a sense for how um, people feel about the direction that we're going and then the things that we can identify that we can help um, create different opportunities for them to learn and grow and to better serve the community. And so I really want to jump on to uh, employee resource groups. These are groups of self-identified staff who have an affinity with another group. And so uh, I'll just, I'll share that the city has the new, has a group called um, Women in the Profession, uh, a women's employee resource group, um, primarily made up of women, but not exclusively. It also includes men on the team who are, uh, advocates for cha policy changes and procedure changes in the city of Bloomington about ways that we can make the workplace better for women. And so this group um, is now fostered and created. Uh, and it really does help employee engagement, fosters this deep connection to the organization now and into the future. As we think about the great resignation and people's ability to move employment rather quickly, rather easily, um, doing the things that can help retain and retain talent in this organization is important. And so really helping to foster that connection, that engagement to the city of Bloomington is really important. Uh, we did a, um, a listening session with other agencies and other peer local governments around the, the region who have started these employee resource groups as a way for us to learn a best practice so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we actually drafted much of the language from other places uh, as, as a way to streamline. So there's an element of efficiency, which um, uh, attorney Peter Zuniga always appreciates because uh, we rely on him on so many things. And um, as I sh shared, that there are additional ERGs uh, in the pipeline, uh, including um, um, some that I, I think we will bring back to this group when we do our, our annual report uh, later, um, I'm sorry, early part of December. Uh, and again, I, I also want to focus on some of the learning and training. Uh, there's been uh, a huge uh, increase in uh, immigrants and refugees in the community in the city of Bloomington and in Minnesota generally. And so we have really partnered with some of our uh, partners around the region and around uh, the city of Bloomington uh, with staff in the community to really help inform the training about what is this impact. And so we've done uh, trainings. Uh, particularly for uh, Af uh, Afghani refugees who've come to, to Minnesota to just give some additional insight into the struggles that those individuals might be having and ways that we can be more inclusive and more welcoming and more supportive in our service delivery. And then lastly, uh, cultural agility training. Uh, we uh, hired a, uh, a 
well-known, well-regarded consultant who is, um, is so successful that she chooses the clients with which she works. Um, and we had to pass a rigorous uh, screening test, and I'm proud to say that we passed. Uh, we were able to work with Janice Downing, who was known in the Twin Cities area as, as one of the best. Uh, and she has provided uh, nine cultural agility trainings for supervisors, for managers, for frontline staff, and really kind of helps to set behaviors and expectations around cultural differences to become more culturally agile and aware, and really provide a framework for kind of understanding how a workplace is different, and then some tools for helping to resolve some conflicts as they come as they exist. Um, and then we've also sort of created this brainstorm for creating an ideal w work culture, which I think um, we strive at and work at every day to support uh, the work that we do. Um, you know, 75% of our budgets are people who deliver service and making those people who deliver service better is better for everybody. And it has this kind of a um, compounding benefit that the resident's happier, the employee is happier which means we're going to get better service and, and better product at the end of it. Uh, the also, the other thing that we are doing is really um, trying to create more uh, robust measures around what are we learning. And so of that uh, survey that we conducted, 63% uh, agree that uh, impact of race on our work is valuable. We recognize that it's a reality and it's a challenge. Um, of the participants who participated in the training, you know, we've seen a 36% increase, you know, self-identified increase in understanding of cultural agility. Um, more than two-thirds felt that the tools that they got were practical. And I don't mean just that they were interesting, but things that they could apply in a real-life situation. And we've had anecdotal stories of folks, particularly code enforcement, who are out in the field doing tough work, using the tools on their day-to-day -day basis. And so that's really helpful. Uh, and then 50% uh, have really uh, likely apply these, thing, these skills in the workplace. And so we're really fortunate to have strong partnerships with, with great thought leaders in, in the um, in this work, and, and I'm excited to continue on on this journey. And so at this point, Padau is going to transition into sharing some information about the Inclusive Culture Survey uh, that we launched this year. Awesome. Thank you, Faith, and thank you, Mike. Um, so we launched this survey back in May 2022, and this is just a high-level summary of the survey, and I'm going to talk about some key questions that we talked um, that we asked in the survey as well. But um, just for a brief survey of demographics, um, this survey was sent out to all um, city employees that are full-time, part-time, seasonal, and these are frontline staff, supervisors, and managers. I'm not going to go through everything on this slide, but I do want to highlight um, that the length of employment, the majority of the folks who are with the city of Boomtown has been here for 10 to 20 years who answered the survey questions, and the age um, of majority is 35 to 44 years old. So some of the questions we ask is if the city of Bloomington employees respect individuals and value differences. And we saw that 63%, about 63% agree or strongly agree. And then we also asked if employees of different backgrounds interact well with each other. And folks um, answer that 72% agree and strongly agree. Next slide here. We wanted to see if there was a difference of impact between the city of Bloomington and within employees' departments, if their, um, their commitment to meeting the needs of historically marginalized communities, including black, indigenous, and people of color, women, uh, people with disabilities, and LGBTQIA plus communities. And what's great here is that we see that they are aligned. The city of Bloomington is committed to this work and the department, and, and that commitment is trickled into the departments. And we see that nearly 60% agree or strongly agree that the city of Bloomington and their department are committed to marginalized communities. The next slide here, we ask um, folks if they are actively involved in advancing racial equity and their projects or teams, and 40% actively embeds racial equity into their projects and teams. We also ask um, if they will be more active in advancing racial equity if, and then there's a line of questions, and I wanted to highlight that 50% are happy with their level of engagement in advancing racial equity, and 30% are more um, likely to be informed about how to advance racial equity. So this is telling for us because our city of, of Bloomington employees are engaging in this work and or they wanna learn more about how to advance racial equity. 
We also asked if folks felt like they belong here at the city of Bloomington, and 70% agree or strongly agree that they feel like they belong here at the city of Bloomington. And we also asked if they can bring their whole self um, to work, and 50% agree or strongly agree that they can bring their whole self to work. One thing as part of the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belong is that we want to make sure folks can bring the most authentic selves to work and respectively and using the cultural agility training that we've had uh, these past years or a couple of years, they can continue to show some compassion and grace and support each other as colleagues. For this next slide here um, is about microaggressions. We asked this question and microaggressions is one of the topics that staff consistently requested to learn more about and get training. And so um, and within the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging, uh, we provided volunteer opportunities for supervisors and employees. Um, in 2021, we engaged in one-on-one -on -one coaching and individual uh, employee and supervisor um, and regarding microaggression trainings in the workplace. Um, so this data slide before you indicates the concerns in the workplace in regards to microaggressions. And so due to this, we're committed to provide resources and tools um, to the staff to address this topic. The next slide here, we also ask if um, the City of Bloomington employees uh, feel that they have a mentor at the City of Bloomington. We saw that only 30% feels that they have a mentor at work. And this is vital information to know because we know that when someone shows up to work and they feel like they have a mentor, it's another key to retention and keeping them longer um, with, the, with the employer or with the city of Bloomington. So moving forward, uh, we have four key objectives. One is that we wanna understand how these results challenge or affirm the way that we work. So when assessing these results, we're gonna take that into account of how we wanna move forward and making sure that we are embedding all of um, the work and knowledge that we have to support our city of employee staff. Secondly, we will convene employee cultural work groups. And so we want to not only take the survey results, but we wanna go back to um, our colleagues and ask them about how we can make this workforce better for everyone. Third, we will cultivate opportunities for connections by creating this cultural work group, this convening um, employee cultural work group. We're able to build that relationship, make that connection so people can get to know each other, um, not only at like a group or, um, group or team level, but at an interpersonal level as well. And then fourth, uh, we'll work with human resources to address any specific concerns, such as how to create mentors in the workplace and or the microaggressions. And with that, I'll pass it to Faith. Thanks, Fidel. Uh, so now we'll transition into a um, of the key programs and services related to equitable programs and services, our 2022 highlights. So these things will cover uh, updates related to the city's language access plan, racial equity impact assessments, and also the Welcome in Cities certification. So the city is in the process of finalizing our language access plan. And uh, the language asset plans, it really just ensures that we have the tools and resources needed to effectively communicate with limited English proficiency individuals. And then also it ensures that they have a way to access the city services programs and activities. And so uh, one key component of that work today has uh, been to able to identify our vital documents for the organizations. So we had all of our departments and divisions identify their vital documents and those are the documents that we wanna have translated and available in various languages because they're important for folks to be able to to access resources. We're also uh, in the process of developing a bilingual staff compensation policy, working with HR to do that. Um, and one of the, the key highlights here is that we've seen a uh, increased interest uh, and also usage of departments utilizing interpretation and translation resources. Uh, and, and so that's a good thing, right? When people are utilizing those resources and asking questions. Um, the other thing that we highlight here is work related to the racial equity impact assessments and training. And so um, we have trained staff both in the community development department and the public works department. Uh, we created a, a resource on the SharePoint site that allows people to be able to access that information, uh, data, and just other tools that they may need in order to complete their racial equity impact assessments. And we have about six assessments that have already been before you through the community development department, uh, and then uh, at least two in the pipeline for public works. 
Um, now I'll spend some time just quickly talking about the Welcoming America certification. And so again, this was one of those things that we listed as a top priority for 2022. Um, and just to recap, uh, the organization Welcome in America has a Welcome in City certification uh, that it uh, provides to cities. And so it's a formal designation for cities and counties who've created policies that uh, reflect their values to immigrant and refugee inclusion. Um, and so this formal designation is a benefit to cities uh, because it allows them to distinguish sort of the work that they're doing in their community. Uh, it also builds a competitive advantage, right? And as you're looking to attract people to your community, uh, and then it also allows us access to a network of other cities, uh, both on the regional, national, and global level who are doing this type of work. And so the city has successfully completed our initial pre-assessment, uh, and we are entering to the application phase. And so the application phase takes about 9 to 12 months, and so up to a year, because there's information that will be requested of and that we have to return, and there's a little bit of a back and forth. Uh, we can complete this application in partnership with other organizations in our community. And so we're happy to report that the school district agreed to be a named partner in our application. Um, this means that the work that the school district is doing to value immigrant and refugee inclusion will be counted uh, in our application. And so it increases our, increases our chances of being able to obtain that formal designation. The other thing that we highlight here is that uh, as we've sort of transitioned into becoming a part of this network, this year the city of Bloomington will be for the first time participating in National Welcome Week. And so uh, National Welcome Week this year, 2022, uh, is September 9th through 16th. And so it's our first year participating, so our uh, engagement may not be as grand as some of the other cities uh, who have been doing this work for a really long time. Uh, but we've scheduled learn learning and engagement opportunities both for staff uh, and also community during that week. And so you'll receive more information about that in the upcoming one weekly, and you'll also receive an invitation to participate. Next, I'll talk about our Authentic Engagement 2022 highlights, and there are four components that we're gonna focus is on awareness and education, partnerships, recognition and acknowledgement, and spotlight on our office. For awareness and education, um, we are invited to attend classroom visits and community and faith group uh, to give presentations about city resources and services in addition to racial equity toolkits to um, continue the involvement of community and also for us to learn from the community. One key piece here I want to highlight for awareness and education is our On the One Music Festival radio and television uh, promotion. Uh, recently, in an effort to diversify our cultural arts program, the city partnered with Avant Garde uh, to host one of its kind music festival. The festival highlighted R&B, neo soul, reggae, Afrobeat, hip hop, and spoken word, spoken word artists. On the second night of the festival, a neighbor came to faith. <laughs> I'm excited about this part. <laughs> came to faith, grabbed her hand, and said, and I quote, "This is the first time." I felt like the city created something specifically for us, and I've lived here for 30 years, unquote. I just think that was just so fundamental that it impacts um, someone emotionally, mentally, physically. And yes, I cried. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also tabled at Pride 2022 this year, which was exciting to hear that there was a little over 3,000 folks that came there. And we, were, we had the opportunity to meet with residents and community members to engage in continuous dialogue. And we're looking forward to 2023 for Pride. Uh, for partnerships, we have routine meetings with the Office of Educational Equity where we continue to collaborate and share about challenges or, and or provide solutions about what we're learning about what's happening for our K through 12 youth in addition to learning about families and their challenges and lived experiences and how we can also uh, provide city services to support that effort. Another piece here for partnership is our Equity Connect, where the Office of Racial Equity and Inclusion and Belonging is one of the founding members of Equity Connect. Equity Connect is uh, connecting cities, connecting cities uh, with staff who also does racial equity, inclusion, diversity, and equity work. And uh, just this past summer, we were able to host uh, the work plan for Equity Connect, and that was really exciting. For recognition and acknowledgments, um, we 
continue to host uh, pioneers and change makers, and then we continue to issue proclamations. Uh, for the spotlight of our office, um, it was so great to see that Faith, our Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer, um, Council Member Jenna Carter, and also Community Director or Community Development Director Carla Henderson uh, were presenters at the GEAR Conference of 2022 to highlight the City of Bloomington's uh, racial equity work. Uh, so that was exciting. Um, I will also be presenting uh, early, uh, this next month uh, for the Coalition of Asian American Leaders Regional uh, Leadership Summit at the University of Minnesota um, School of Humphrey of Public Affairs. And then the City of Bloomington uh, will showcase in the livability of 100 Best Places to Live profile. Um, and one of the key factors how we made it to the 100 Best Places to Live profile was because of the Office of Racial Equity and Inclusion and Belonging Department or office. Um, so speaking um, of a welcoming um, and the best places to live, um, I wanted to talk about our Welcome to Bloomington update. And what we have done so far is consult with past organizers of city staff about what they've done uh, because we have done this in the past briefly and just talked about what were some challenges they faced and how can we move forward to um, make it better and greater and awesome as well. So that's been really exciting to learn from their um, expertise. And then we also invited community partners, city staff and council members to participate, participate in the program design committee. And um, we, has, we are able to solidify that the meetings will, will start on October, 2022, all the way through March, 2023. Uh, community partners that are currently involved that said yes to being a part of this um, are from the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers in the Twin Cities, uh, which is our um, first started black uh, association for real estate brokers, our Bloomington Foundation, Bloomington Residents, Office of Educational Equity, and VEEP. And in regards to the Welcome to Bloomington, uh, for the next slide, um, the City Council utilizes the International Association for Public Participation for Outreach and Engagement. Um, and so we worked with our um, community outreach um, uh, education, oh, I'm sorry. All right, we, we, we reached out to our co-ed liaison <laughs> um, to determine uh, where the city council or council members will be here. And um, we, were, we believe that it we should be at the collaborate level. And so part of that collaborative piece, we also made a promise to the public, uh, which is on our next slide. And our promise to the public here is that we trust your wisdom in generating ideas for welcoming neighbors to our community. We will raise concerns, seek to find common ground and incorporate your advice and recommendations into the decisions as much as possible. And this is also the same level of engagement of Collaborate um, and there's a similar promise that we put in for the racial equity and strategic planning in 2021. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will pass it on to Mike. And, and Mike, if you don't mind, before you get started, I just wanna share some additional context about the Welcome to Bloomington program. For those of you who may be hearing this for the first time, uh, this is our office, um, really contribution to helping to cultivate that remarkable enduring community, the place where people want to be, uh, by making sure that when people move into our community, they're connected with resources. So everything from like, what do you need to know about your water bill, right, to who's a neighbor in your community that you can call on if something's happening. Um, that's why we were really intentional about bringing in realtors and to inviting them to be a part of this, because we know that they have a big role to play, right, and think about how do we attract people to our community. Also, and just understanding who's moving into our community and how do we get connected with people. And so the, the general premise for this program is that we will have volunteers uh, welcome new members into our community and connect them with resources and just sort of be a partner for them. Um, the, sort of the broader approach to what this program look, look like will be designed by that committee that we are pulling together. And so with that, um, Mike is gonna take over and lead us to a focused conversation because we wanna hear from you uh, sort of your thoughts on how we designed the Welcome to Bloomington uh, program. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor, uh, Council Members. I, this is really your opportunity to speak, but when we think about the Welcome to Bloomington initiative, we would like for you to hear your sort of voice about why something like that is important for the community, what are some measures of success that you would see 
And then uh, more importantly, uh, how would you like to help? Because we're always looking for, for people to help us. And so this is really an open conversation for the city council to kind of talk about uh, the value that you see, things that you would like to see measured and, um, and, and tracked over time, and then uh, opportunities that you have for in, uh, being involved. Well, thank you for that. Uh, before we get to it, the one thing that you didn't mention, I thought you were going to mention, was the National Forum for Black Public Administrators Conference coming up next year in Minneapolis. That is true. There's so much going there on. There's so much going on. <laughs> there's so much going on. And we, uh, for those of you who don't, we had the opportunity to go and meet with conference planners last week and was very proud to see that three of Bloomington staff members are are part of the committee's chairing committees basically helping this whole thing run. And it's, uh, it's a testament to the work that is being done and the involvement and the leadership shown by our, our staff members, which I've said before and will say again, a second to none. And it's, uh, it, was, it was very nice to be able to, to go and meet with these folks and say, look at all the great work we're doing here in Bloomington and look at these great folks we have uh, working for us. So, so Thank you, you, Mayor. You forgot that. <laughs> 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 Wanted to make sure we called that out. Um, so to, uh, to Mr. Sable's questions here, why is this important? What will success look like? How would how would y'all like to be involved? Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember Martin. So, Mayor, one question before we get started with this. Are we going to have an opportunity to ask any questions from the presentation earlier? Just a couple of things. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes I, we, we wanted you to ask questions throughout. Sorry, Sorry I wasn't I, able to get a hold of the mayor, and, I, <laughs> and you guys were cruising along. I didn't want to start. Um, I have several questions, but I, I'm just going to try to just pick just pick one here um, that I had um, that I was going through this, and I just learned about microaggressions. And uh, so I'm just wondering if the public is watching this, could you just could somebody just give a, a short definition of what a microaggression is? Yeah, uh, Mayor Bussey, Councilmember Lohman, uh, yes. Yeah, so a brief description of what microaggressions is. Uh, oftentimes, these are sort of like slights, or if sometimes unintentional and or intentional, but really sort of like slight uh, instances that occur to people, particularly people of protected class. Um, it, it sort of differs between sort of outright discrimination because oftentimes there are things that are occurring over a period of time, right? So uh, an example of that, right, is when oftentimes women are presenting Sometimes like, people can say to them, can you speak up a little bit, right? And they'll ask them that multiple times, but you may have a man who's presenting and he's never asked that question, right? And so again, that's an example of a microaggression. It's not necessarily discriminatory, right? But it's a thing that's happened to you because of your particular identity uh, that doesn't happen to someone else. And so if you recall back on that slide, there were sort of examples in, in that question that talked about, uh, have you ever heard someone say an off-color joke about sort of your identity and just different things like that? And so uh, we, we know that there is an opportunity to do more work there in terms of providing resources to staff, both to understand what microaggressions are, understand how they may be sort of like actors in those microaggressions and also how to address them when they're on the receiving end. Well, thank you for that, that, that. I actually learned about them through my uh, employee engagement group, so I'm happy to hear that we're having employee engagement groups. I know I've been championing that for a long time, so I'm happy to see that happening. Uh, in terms of why I think this uh, is important, um, I think it is important uh, because our demographics are obviously uh, changing. Um, and the one interesting thing for me was just trying to convince someone very close to me to move to Bloomington <laughs> because they just didn't have any idea what was going on in Bloomington. Um, and, 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 um, and, and so I just think it's so important that when folks move here or, or even considering uh, coming here, uh, that we are just very intentional um, uh, about, about those experiences in which uh, th that they have. And I'll just say one last thing. Um, I know we've got a lot on the agenda uh, today. Um, I'll never forget, I was on a, on a conference, and, um, and it was hosted at St. Paul. And I think the city manager may have been on this too, but uh, the Mall of America had been hosting a piece, and they, uh, this person came, uh, there was a big group of folks that came down into Bloomington. And it really doesn't matter for the story who the person was. Um, but, you know, at the end of the presentation, they, they said to me, you know, 
you know, uh, Council Member Loman, this is just the greatest city ever. And I hope to one day be able to, to live in Bloomington. Right now, I can't afford to live, you know, for the affordable housing. And so, I, you know, as I think about the policies and the things that we do, how we welcome folks, um, this is critical to, to what we're, we're trying to do. And I, I just appreciate that we're, we're being real intentional um, about this, Mayor. It's Council Member Martin up next, then Council Member Carter, and then Council Member Coulter. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you for the comprehensiveness of, of the vision and the approach that you're taking to this work. It's, it's clear where the synergies are starting to, to build momentum, so that's really neat. Uh, just briefly, I, I know we've in the past we've had things like the Welcome Dinner Program, um, things like that. I, I would be curious moving forward, um, the, the topic has come up of bringing individuals onto the team to be able to do referrals to other organizations and agencies for programs and services. Uh, so I would love to see, um, and it sounds like we're already working with the, the school district on some other things, but whether it's the school district, the county, uh, representatives from, say, Parks and Rec, so that periodically throughout the year, however often it may be, we could look at, say, the new homestead applications, mm -hmm. send out a welcome packet maybe with directories to how to get in touch with different elements of the city, uh, directory, uh, how to get in touch with those partners, uh, maybe businesses in the community that mm -hmm. would like to highlight themselves. Um, and then if that's a, a formal orientation event, whatever it may be, to be able to, to rally all those partners and have a one-stop shop for our newest residents to be able to get engaged uh, with all these programs and services, uh, I think would be super neat. Uh, and, and then in general, um, however we're first getting engaged with new residents, it would be really neat, and I'm guessing you're heading this direction already, to have unique trackable, whether it be URLs or QR codes mm -hmm. or however, whatever we're directing them to, to know specifically that channel produced X number of not only clicks to, to those things wherever they may be, but all the way to the end result of I got a packet and I showed up at a park to meet my council member mm -hmm. and all these other folks. So yeah. if everybody's looking for to connect with people so we can facilitate, I guess. Good point, Council Member. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I just want to um, echo Council Member Martin's sentiments. I think that the work that you all are leading and that staff across Bloomington are doing is just really incredible, and it's transformational. Like, it truly is transformational work. And so I uh, just want to thank you again for your leadership in these efforts. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and some of them I will take offline because I know we have we are limited on time. But... Um, you talked a little bit, or you talked a lot about uh, the hiring process and um, diversifying our employee base. And I'm just curious if you are doing, I think all of this work really helps um, ensure that we are re retaining employees, good employees. But I'm wondering if you're tracking metrics related to employee retention um, and specifically breaking it down by demographics so we can see where we may be. Um, may, where maybe we have some opportunity. And so um, could you speak a little bit to that? Oh, Mayor Bussey, Councilmember Carter, I'm actually going to defer this question to Mike Sable because he has some exciting news to share about how the Human Resources Department is partnering with our office to do some of that work. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Carter, uh, the short answer to your question is yes. We, we do track that data uh, by race, by ethnicity, by gender, uh, in terms of both uh, new hires, but also the, the retention rate uh, and the turnover rate, generally speaking. I will share that uh, historically the turnover rate uh, for people of color it has been higher than, than white employees. And we recognized that almost immediately when we started to gather and really frame up the data differently. And that's actually helped some sort of inform both of our training for supervisors and managers about how to create a more welcoming environment, how to be more thoughtful about how they lead uh, their divisions and their parts of the organization. Um, and so one of the things that we're really excited about is the forward-facing dashboard that we're making right now that we will have launched uh, hopefully by December of this year, both in terms of the demographic data of the organization and HR, but then also have that tied to the uh, strategic plan to really Right, as the city manager would say, to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be includes the organization. And so I'm um, really looking forward to, to showcasing that data differently. Well, that is very exciting. Yes. I, I'm <laughs> guessing that I am not the only one up here that will be thrilled to see that. So um, <laughs> awesome. The other thing that I uh, wanted to ask about was the survey. Um, so first of all, I just really appreciate you sharing the results. I know... Um, 
thanks to the city manager and leadership, because I know that that can be really difficult, that those can spur difficult conversations. And I'm curious, though, um, you said that I think it was a little over 100 people completed the survey and that it was frontline staff and some managers and supervisors, but was it open to everybody to take? Okay. Uh, Mayor Bussey, uh, Council Member Carter, yes, it was open to everyone. We sent it out to like the all city staff email listserv, which I think reaches about 600 people. And so maybe even more uh, than, than it applies, but we did send it out to all city staff and uh, we captured that information, uh, I believe it was, uh, June, June or July, June, June 2022, 26. we had about 122 people. We've had more people respond to the survey since then, but we utilized those summaries because we spent the time, a lot of time analyzing it at that point. Mm -hmm. So now that we've had some more responses trickle in, we're going to go back and update uh, some of those summaries and we'll be sharing the entire report with the city staff. Great. And do you plan to do that report year after year to be able to compare the data? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so I will save my, the rest of my questions for an offline conversation, um, but I will say to the questions that you posed about why the Welcome to Bloomington work is important, um, I will say when I've had conversations with residents in the community, the types of things that would be included in this, I feel like are really, have been, have been brought up consistently, mm -hmm. whether it's a kind of a one-stop shop for residents who are new and who may have a harder time navigating our website, for example. Um, so I think a lot of the work that you are doing is also tied to this work, the, the work you're doing already, like um, tran the translating of city materials and resources. Um, and then I think specifically about the um, different groups that were formed at the onset of the pandemic. And one of the things that came up in those groups also was mm -hmm. wanting to better understand what resources, services, mm -hmm. um, things that the city can offer. And one of the examples was from a woman who was like, I literally have lived here for over five years and I just learned that I can drop my bill off, that there's like a, a mailbox at the front that I can, you know, she's like, I always thought I had to get here during the office hour or like the, the city business hours. And so that still sticks in my head as um, just one, one example of many that I've heard from residents in the community. Um, in terms of what does success look like, I mean, I think that um, things like being recognized as one of the top 100 places to live, 30, 33? 37? Okay. I mean, I think things like that are really important. And then obviously we do our annual city survey and there are questions around um, feeling welcomed and belonged. And I know in the past we've started break asking to break that down by demographics. And so I think even using that as an indicator could be helpful. And then I will, I don't know how I would like to be involved, but we can talk more about that too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I want to first of all, I just want to echo the comments of my colleagues. I, um, I think this work can be really, really challenging to sort of operationalize and to sort of, um, for lack of a better term, quantify why, <clears throat> excuse me, why it's important and how it sort of directly has an effect on operations within e within the city and life really within the city and I think you've done a really excellent job of doing just that and and um, I, I think that's really really important information for us the council and, and for the community to hear as well so I want to thank you for that um, I would also you know whether it's sort of anecdotal reports or, or whatever it may whatever form it may take um, I would like to see more information on how staff is sort of using in a practical way the learning and, and training training and all that and the, the assistant city manager mentioned an example from I think it was environmental health or code enforcement um, and um, that I mean that kind of information is really really helpful to to us I'm sure, I, I think um, as far as the the welcome to Bloomington proposal I I frankly find myself a little bit challenged to answer some of these questions because I've literally lived in this town my whole life. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, I, I the reason that I, I stayed is, is perhaps not representative of the community at large. Um, but I, I think Councilmember Carter hit a really, hit on a really important point. And I guess my suggestion would be 
something akin to sort of qualitative research among, to the extent that that's possible, among relatively new residents. You know, you've been here a year. Why, you know, what made you stay? You've been here five years, 10 years, 20 years even. Um, what, you know, what brought you here? What made you stay? And, and that sort of thing. Because um, I think, you know, the, the things that brought folks to this community 50, 60 years ago when my grandparents moved in, um, I think in some ways those are going to be different. And in some ways I think they're going to be very similar to the things that, brought, that bring folks in here. And so I think um, kind of uh, drilling in on, on those particular aspects directly from residents um, is going to be really, really critical because I, I think we as elected members can offer our opinions, um, but I think this is something where we're going to need to hear directly from the community in a sort of qualitative way. So i um, looking forward to, to seeing where this goes. And um, I guess I would just say as far as my own involvement, let me know. Okay. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Well, we're all going to weigh in. Of course. <laughs> That's what you asked for, right? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, echoing everyone else. Thank you for this. This is important work, and uh, I, you know, I'm especially appreciative of the data. Uh, the, so, as you all know, my reputation already. Um, so, thank thank you for that. I have uh, I had a couple of quick, very quick questions about the data. The first one was when you did the microaggressions um, survey. Uh, what, what were the were those numbers? Um, I experienced them numbers or were they like I saw that but maybe it wasn't me or maybe it was me? Yeah. Uh, Mayor Blissey, Council Member Delisandro, they were uh, responding from that individual's perspective. Okay. So the, the question sort of says how often have you experienced something like this? Very good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, I have really quickly is from your first um, information about um, employee um, uh, hiring and um, is 10% in three years good in your opinion? Is it great in your opinion? How do you feel like you compare to, to how we're doing there against maybe you know other data that you have? Mayor Blissey, Council Member Delisandro, I, I think that, well, one, we were comparing 2019 and 2021. We just kind of skipped over 2020. One, because the city had a hiring freeze, right? So there wasn't a lot of opportunities to hire, uh, but also just recognizing that 2020 was 2020. Um, and so I think when we compare those sort of that shift, like a 10% shift, in terms of BIPOC representation and new hires from one year to the year after. And we connect that to the, the tools and the resources and the strategies that would implement it. I see it as transformational. Mm -hmm. um, I When, when I, we think about how we see sort of shifts um, in our workforce data and other places, we don't see that uh, type of gain. And uh, Assistant City Manager Mike Sable, feel free to jump in and correct me if you think differently. Um, so we are really excited about uh, those outcomes and really excited about the opportunity to uh, get to parity with our community. Our, our goal is to have our city of Bloomington workforce mirror the population that we sure. serve. And we think with these sort of systemic changes um, and the different policies and practices that we're integrating it within uh, that area that we'll be able to get there. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I was going to say it was phenomenal, and then y'all <laughs> didn't sell it, so I wasn't sure. So no, I thought it. I thought it was. It's incredible, actually. I've never seen anything like it. So congratulations on that. Um, okay, so you asked questions. Uh, the one of the things that I, I think we don't necessarily do a great job of, and I think it's not on purpose. It's just a function of, of, of um, us talking so much about our residents um, and property taxes. And then those things kind of come together to talk mostly about people who own home, homes here. Um, I'm curious about um, looking at the welcome to Bloomington through the lens of our more transient communities. So we have both Normandale Community College. We also have the Northwest Sciences um, uh, University. Um, we have uh, renters who are here potentially for you know, three or four years, not necessarily the decades of some of our residents. And so a focus potentially on how, how we do uh, for someone who isn't necessarily planning to be here for that long, but while they're here, they should get one of the best experiences we can try to offer. I think looking that at that lens would be pretty interesting. Um, the other area, and you, I'm sure you all, because of your expertise, think about it already, but I haven't necessarily seen us focus on it, is um, you, you've talked about um, intersectionality a lot at, at kind of the framing level. So I'm kind of curious about how 
how intersectionality would play into uh, this kind of new resident, um, you know, programming, if you will, or, or the, the, the kind of work that we might do there. So those are some recommendations um, to, to consider. Um, and then finally, in terms of how to be involved, um, you know, I think we, I don't want to speak for my colleagues here, but I, we're all, as elected officials, we're in kind of a u unique space, right? Number one, we absolutely want to talk to our constituents all the time, um, especially when we're going to ask them for a vote, of course. But, but I think when we are able to be in the community with our residents, um, we bring a lens of not only um, specific interest in their feelings and understanding them as constituents in our districts um, or in the city at large, but also um, as advocates for them here at the dais. And so to the extent that you're doing in, in a district or in a particular area of community outreach or activity, that's when I would absolutely love to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll be brief. I um, like what you're doing here, and my only suggestion thought is um, if and when it's appropriate to take a look at how you might do something similar for the business community to welcome new businesses in here, welcome businesses that are uh, providing goods or services within the community, even if they aren't located here, city vendors, that sort of thing, to make sure that they feel welcome as well. So I, I like the direction you're going. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Nelson. I looked over my shoulder to my <laughs> community development director, Carla Henderson. Sounds like another partnership is in the works. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, council members, if I may tell a story from today, I, I went to have a meeting with uh, Community Development Director Henderson, and she was literally stuffing uh, welcome bags for a small business filled with Bloomington swag as they were moving oh. their employee base from Egan to Bloomington. And uh, she was doing it literally today by herself and, and with Karen Lynn Lane. And it was, uh, as you said it, I had to smile because right, there was, it was a Sorry, doing it. <laughs> perfect alignment to, to an earlier uh, meeting I had. So, Mayor, if I might follow up then, that's where I could help. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like delivery of that type of stuff, let me know. <laughs> well, thank you for this presentation. And, and in answer to your question, I'll just chime in on the whole welcoming thing and then we can, we can get moving here. Uh, Minnesota is notorious for being difficult to break into. Minnesotans, I mean, I, I still hang out with the guys that I went to grade school with, and I admit that. Um, but it's, it, Jamie does too. Yep, it's, it's just hard to break into Minnesota. So whatever we can do to welcome people into this community, I think is just vitally important. And I think it absolutely has to tie in with the Bloomington Tomorrow Together, the, with the goals and with the strategies that were laid out with that. Because it, it, a lot of the goals and strategies there had to do with making sure that people feel connected to their neighborhoods and, and whatever ways we can find to do that is the more the better. And, uh, and I think we're headed in the right direction, looking at some of the, you know, these, um, uh, the notions of a, of a center of community. I haven't talked about that in a while lately, have I? Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the plans for the, the shelters in the parks mm -hmm. as, as a gathering space, um, the, the music yeah. series that has gone on, uh, just our, the, the, um, uh, the farmer's market, the, the availability of food trucks. There's just so many different ways where you can set up areas and or set up opportunities for people to to be welcomed and to feel welcomed. And I think we have to look at as uh, wide a variety as possibilities to do that very thing. Um, and because it, it makes a difference. It, uh, you know, stuffing those bags and delivering them makes a difference. People remember that. And it's it's a huge thing. So big and small, I think as many things as we can do, the better. So Thank you for that work, and let us all know. I'll, I'll volunteer everybody up here. Let us know what we can do. Uh, uh, we, will, we will certainly help out in any way. Thank you, Mayor Bliss and Council, for your time. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Mayor, <clears throat> just a quick question. Okay. Um, we've had great conversation and great stuff tonight. I'm, I'm just curious um, where you're at with, uh, with the agenda and if you're thinking maybe we need to extend something, move something around. You read my mind, council member. What I was going to do more than anything was to point out that we were made it to the consent business, and it's now exactly just about 9 o'clock. So we're three hours in, and we're just to the consent business. Two and a half. Two and a half, excuse me, two and a half. That's I won't exaggerate. <laughs> Uh, so I think we're going to plow ahead and see where we get over the next the course of the next hour or so here. Uh, I would just ask council members to maybe keep that in mind that we are 
pushing the clock here pretty hard, and we still have a, a few things that, on our agenda that we have to get through. So, um, and I would, uh, I don't know if our our friends from the MPCA are coming virtually or if they're arriving or if virtually. virtually. Okay, so we might uh, you might want to text them and advise them as to where we are in the agenda, and they we might have to. I don't want to keep them here all night just to to break their hearts at a quarter to eleven. So. Let's move on to uh, item three, our consent business. Uh, Councilmember Carter has our consent agenda tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have any holds. Okay, yep, would you like to hold 3.9? Okay, I thought maybe I heard you say that, so. Um, anybody else have any holds? Okay, so with that, I would move approval of 3.1 to 3.8 and then 3.10 to 3.15. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Lohman to accept tonight's consent business as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item 3.9, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I just wanted to hold this one because, candidly, I do have some concerns about it. I understand it's a timely item that, by agreement, we have to approve it either tonight or modify it or something of that nature, and I don't have any type of proposal to modify it or anything of that nature. I just, I'm concerned that we're spending $50,000 uh, um, on commuter services for the entire Twin Cities region. There's only five cities that are participating in this, and it's uh, the 494 Coalition, so we don't have Plymouth. They dropped out a few years ago. We don't have Woodbury. Invergrove Heights, I mean, there's there's significant population bases along 494 that aren't participating in this program. And, um, you know, the, the reality is, is Bloomington is paying uh, nearly a third of the dues for this because we're, we're a bigger city than the other city. So um, we also probably realistically get benefit because we're a bigger city than those other cities. Um, and so, uh, you know, I... I, I'm not strongly opposed to it. I just would really, really, really like way more information about the benefits of it, what the um, you know what their goals are, how those are being achieved, how those impact Bloomington businesses, versus being distributed throughout the Twin Cities metro area. Why there's this weird funding source that only five cities have to pay for it, and it's not covered elsewhere, that type of stuff. I just don't know that I can get those answers tonight. Um, and to my understanding, is, uh, from information from the city manager, we have to act tonight. And we, we, we've been in this for years, and, and it's, you know, it is a sum of money. It's not a huge sum of money, but I would like to consider looking at this in the future and determining the direction that we want to go. I appreciate that, Council Member. Um, I know that Councilmember Martin and I think Councilmember, or excuse me, uh, Glenn Markegaard are, are two representatives for 494 Corridor Commission. Uh, I will answer as a past member of the Corridor Commission. I think I spent four or five years in, on the Corridor Commission. And yes, you're right. I think a, a majority of their work is toward this commuter connections, basically trying to get people out of their cars and into, into the mass transit or buses in, in some way, shape, or form. However, that's not the extent of what they do. Uh, they do a lot of outreach and a lot of engagement. Uh, it's... Uh, the, the, I think they're, they're three staff members. They they do this. They're five staff or whatever they are. They they get out and 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 connect with people. I think they they were at our Pride Festival. I see them at the um, uh, I see them at the farmers market at least a couple three times during the year. So they they do make uh, one on one connections to try and talk about the different options. They're also uh, it the, the group in the past has been very helpful from a, a legislative standpoint, uh, being able to to make the case to to uh, legislators about the needs along the 494 corridor, and specifically our portion of the 494 corridor, which is different than a lot of the other portions. And uh, when, when we ultimately rose to the top with the, the corridors of commerce money and with some of the state funding that came our way, and ultimately the, the federal funding that came our way for this portion of the 494 rebuild, it, uh, I won't say they, they, it was the only reason, but it was certainly a reason, the fact that we had a coalition of five cities working together to try and address this problem. Was was taken into account, and and it was a it, it's much more powerful than one city speaking by for its own voice. I'll turn it over to Glenn or to uh, Councilmember Martin. See if they have anything else to add. Uh, do that. Sure. Uh, Mayor Busey, Councilmember Nelson. Good evening. Uh, just one thing to add is that the uh, commuter services, which is the 
kind of outreach arm of the corridor commission. It does just represent those five cities. So if you lived in Woodbury but worked in one of the five cities, you will get services. But if you did not have any connection to those five cities, you would not. Um, there are other transportation management organizations within the region uh, that would provide services in, in other areas. Just wanted to point that out. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and, and just real briefly for disclosure, I also serve as the Treasurer for Move Minnesota, which is another TMO organization. Uh, but I think just in general, considering, uh, say for example, a lot of their work is focused on um, telework and encouraging telework. Now coming out of a pandemic where virtually every employer dove face first into telework, what does that look like moving forward? So at some point, maybe having some of their executive leadership just pop by to say, here's what our work plans are, here's what our deliverables are projected to be, uh, and some of the data to prove out that value um, uh, for, for dues paid, I think, is certainly helpful. Uh, who, who, who's the chair of the Corridor Commission now? Uh, Rebecca Schack, a council member from Minnetonka. Mm, okay. Yeah, I, it, it would, would it be helpful? I, I agree we're, we're kind of under the time crunch here. But it might be worth looking at the different things. We make these appointments every year, you know, uh, at the first of the year, whether it's 494 Corridor Commission, 35W uh, Alliance. Uh, we, we have these different groups that we work with. Uh, maybe it's worth bringing folks in to a, to a study session and trying to learn more about what these different groups do, what their outcomes are, what their goals are, and that kind of thing. Because I, I appreciate your questions of it, Council Member. Council Member Nelson? Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and I would appreciate that. And, and uh, the one thing I would point out is this one seems fundamentally different than some of the other one. I was on the 35W Solutions Alliance. It's a small, I think we pay for insurance <laughs> in that one. There isn't staff. There is um, uh, a lobbyist, Vanasic, that works similarly. Yep. It has county participation as well as all the cities along there, but it's it's a much more modest fee, and they, they do that group sure. legislative portion of it there. Uh, you know, this one has a, a much more direct service uh, uh, for it, and I'm just, you know, Sure. Since we pay so much of, as a percentage of those dues, I, I just thought it was important for us to take a look at that and, and um, uh, see, just to make sure we're getting good value for Bloomington. I appreciate that. Part of that, so. so, so uh, it, but I don't, I don't mean to derail it, and I know it's after nine. We, you know, just got to it at two and a half hours into it, and, and we do have a timely issue here that we, we have to act one way or the other. So. And if uh, I mean, if you're comfortable with it, how about if we also just make the commitment to making sure that we, we learn more, we get some more information about our different groups that we belong to, the affinity groups that we belong to, the advocacy groups, and just and th that being one of them, that we get a report and try to make sure everybody's up to speed as to exactly what the groups are. Good with that? Okay. With that, council member, uh, are you comfortable moving it or? Or Council Member Carter, could you? Yeah. <laughs> Gladly. Okay, I would move to approve the INF 494 Corridor Commission 2023 dues and budget. Second. Second. <laughs> Motion by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member Loma to accept item 3.9 on our agenda. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Moving on to item four on our agenda, our, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And item 4.1 is a discussion about proposed variances for a sign at the new Schmidt Music building. Mr. Centenario from our planning department is here. Good evening, Mr. Centenario. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if I could share, I can control the slides and uh, I can share the presentation from WebEx. Thank you. Okay, thank you, good evening. Uh, so the next on the agenda relates to uh, zoning variances, specifically for signs. Uh, and in this case, uh, it, it's two, a couple variances for 7800 picture drive, both for setback as well as height. and. With signs and variances, generally it's a, it's a very technical uh, technical thing, and I'll I'll try to explain why variances are needed, and uh, in this case, why we're recommending approval of 
var some variances and denial of, of other of another variance. So we are we're looking at the, the former Life Touch site at 7800 Picture Drive. Uh, Schmidt Music has acquired this property and is currently uh, uh, renovating it uh, to be their their main headquarters. And so, in addition to office office space, they also intend to have a retail uh, component as well as uh, storage for their operations. Uh, but if you look on the south along the interstate, um, you see a little red circle, and that's that's the sign in question that we're talking about tonight. And we've all driven by it many times, uh, so it's a, it still says Life Touch, um, unless something changed very recently. But uh, that's the sign where the, the Schmidt Music would like to convert it to an electronic graphic display sign. And here's, here's an image from the as-built survey, and the code requirement for signs or freestanding signs is 20 feet. So there has to be at least 20 feet between the property line and uh, the edge of a freestanding sign. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, I'm not sure if you can make out the, the numbers, but from 494, it's about 14 feet, and from the picture drive to the east, it's about 10 and a half feet. And so there really essentially is a cleanup item, and I'll explain why. Uh, they're seeking variances to, re to reduce the setback requirement to match the existing condition. And the reason they're, they're seeking that and, and why the city staff is supportive of these variances is that it was made non-conforming by uh, MnDOT right-of-way acquisition. Uh, so that area in the red, uh, pretty, pretty soon after the, the development was completed in 1968, uh, MnDOT acquired right-of-way for uh, Interstate 494. That, made, that acquisition made the sign non-conforming from a setback perspective. And you know, we usually like to do these kind of cleanup items of when we have these sorts of situations, but that wasn't done in 1970 or whatever year that was. So, that's, so we're, we're looking to try and clean that up right now. And we are supportive of the setback variance. Going on to height, which is the, the, the trickier um, situation. Uh, again, we've seen the sign. Uh, it's over 23 feet, almost 24 feet in height. The code limits height to 20 feet. However, when this sign or the sign was built in the late 60s, it could be 30 feet. So at the time it was compliant, our standards changed. It's legally not conforming today. And uh, what's on screen now is what Schmidt Music would like to uh, install. And so the, the height would stay the same. The base, that stone base that we're familiar with, that would, they're, they would stay the same. Uh, but the sign face, or the sign face would be converted from a traditional kind of cabinet to an electronic graphic display. And it's that conversion to the graphic display uh, that causes these code, uh, code challenges. And it relates to what is maintenance of a sign. Uh, generally speaking, if a sign is legally not conforming, you can change the face of it. Businesses change, new owners, new operations, new tenants. You have the ability to change the face of the sign uh, as maintenance. However, uh, converting it to electronic graphic display is not considered maintenance because you're, you're replacing the entire cabinet itself and you're also increasing light intensity. Uh, so suffice it to say, by the conversion means it would have to be brought up to current requirements. So 20 feet in height, 20 feet in setback for setback. And so when we're looking, we're reviewing variances, first off, we always try to find a code complying alternative to present to an applicant so they don't have to bother uh, with a variance or go through this process of a variance. Uh, and we also look at, well, if they are to apply, uh, what are some of the you know, unique factors with this site uh, that could warrant a variance being approved? One of those factors could be topography, or there's something unique about the pro property from a grade perspective or a, a um, visibility perspective uh, that might warrant a variance. And we didn't feel like this property meets uh, any of those unique characteristics. Uh, I have a, uh, just a couple uh, annotations on grade. The highway immediately south of the sign is about 821. The sign itself is about 823. And then the westbound traffic, you know, just a little bit to the east is 825. So visibility is, is very good on this site. There's nothing really uh, obstructing the view. Uh, in this case, the obstruction is from their contractor's trailer uh, just to the west of the sign. So when we, again, when we re review variances, it really comes down to findings. Uh, the code says all of, the, all of a certain number of findings have to be made in order for the variance to be approved. 
Uh, for the setback variances, we do believe all the findings are being met. For the height, uh, we do not. And that's why for the height variance, we're recommending denial, and the, as well as the Planning Commission recommended denial. And I'll just real briefly go into why we were not able to make the certain findings. So if you look at uh, item C on the screen, uh, that they've there has to be a practical difficulty that's established. Uh, economic considerations alone do not constitute practical difficulties. So if it's just kind of expensive to bring the sign into compliance, that's an economic consideration that we uh, we do not believe would meet this finding. And there also there are code complying alternatives. The face could be changed. They could reduce the height of the sign. They could build a brand new sign that's code complying. Another finding relates to the plight of the landlord, uh, that there is a unique circumstance. And we do not feel that this finding is, is being met. Uh, it's really their desire to have an electronic graphic display uh, that's creating the need to, for a variance. And lastly, uh, the last finding we do not believe is met relates to some sort of unique topographic or physical condition of the land uh, that would warrant a variance, and, and we do not feel that this, this uh, finding is being met. Uh, it's a pretty flat site. Uh, visibility is, is quite good. And ultimately, uh, if the applicant is unable to do an electronic graphic display, they could still have a sign uh, that would be quite visible from the motoring public. Uh, so we do not feel this. Uh, this uh, finding is being met. But ultimately, you know, when you, when you look at what's being proposed, you might scratch your head and say, well, this isn't a big deal. Why, why, are, why is staff recommending denial? And uh, it, you know, it's a perfectly decent looking sign, uh, very understandable that that's what they want to do with their property. Uh, but ultimately, we have to kind of narrow our focus to the findings of fact. And uh, we, do not, we do not believe those findings of fact have been met. So if, if the council really feels that this is an acceptable change that should be allowed, uh, we would recommend that you guide us to uh, make certain changes to the city code uh, and that we could be more mindful and uh, permissive in certain ways uh, for the future. So again, for the setback variances, we are recommending approval. Uh, and for the height, again, so to reduce the height requirement or increase the height for this sign from 20 feet to about 24 feet, uh, we are recommending denial. And I'm happy to answer questions. Council questions. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, information. Did did you have a conversation with the with the um, applicant about choosing a smaller electronic sign? And was there a particular reason that they could not accommodate that? Uh, sure, Ms. Mayor, Councilmember. We. I definitely talked about different alternatives that would be code complying. Uh, you know, having just a, a smaller sign band so they're within that 20 foot allowance. It, it would be very difficult, but they could physically shorten the sign uh, and remove some of that stone, uh, that stone work. It, that, that would be pretty tricky, but it could be done. Uh, but then also they could uh, install a brand new sign, you know, remove the existing one and find a good spot uh, on their property for a brand new sign that meets all code requirements. This is a very, a quite a wide site. There's well over 500 feet of frontage along 494. So we were pretty confident that they there would be other opportunities to locate a freestanding sign. So if they did choose to build a new uh, sign altogether, um, would if they if they tore that one down and put it right back where it was, would we would we still give them the, I guess there's, to me that there were three, three kind of non-conforming things, right? What, so the electronic signage was a thing that triggered all of this. There was the setback and then there was the height. Would, would we, if they tore it down and built a new one, would we let them do it in the same place? And as long as it wasn't 20 feet tall or more than 20 feet tall? Sure, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, uh, they would not be able to do an electronic sign. Uh, they could tear it down and rebuild it uh, as a static uh, monument sign. Okay, so it's the issue of the electronic sign and it triggering, that's not maintenance, that's something else that's causing all this. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Now, I would argue the fact that we have a 20 minute requirement on our delays that our electronic signs are indeed static signs, but, uh, <laughs> but that, that, that's another, <laughs> That's another question for early next year. Trust me on that one. So, 
Council, any additional questions on this? Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, so we got some a submission from their attorney that says uh, practical difficulties um, uh, mean that a property owner proposes to use a property in a reasonable manner not permitted by zoning ordinances. I think that obviously applies. This isn't permitted uh, by zoning ordinances. Um, but then it's uh, the plight of the land owner is due to circumstances unique to the property not created by the landowner. And so can you help me understand, because it was sort of been created by a previous owner, not that landowner. So do, does that, do they meet that part of it? And then if the variance is granted, it will not um, alter the essential character of the locality. And I think it would be, you know, pretty easy to argue that this doesn't alter the essential character. It seems to hinge on the, even from their own submission whether this was unique circumstance not created by the landowner. Sure, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson. Uh, related to the character finding, uh, we, we felt that that finding was met. Uh, we do not believe that converting a, a traditional monument sign to an electronic sign would change the character. And most of the findings we felt are being met uh, by the applicant. I just highlighted the three that uh, we did not meet. Uh, but really with the plight of the, land, the landowner, uh, they still have the ability to have signage. Uh, they, they have the ability to change the signage from um, the previous tenant to what they would like to see. Uh, we don't dictate the specific design of the sign. It's really a, a technical standard, an area uh, and a height. Um, but because they want to do this conversion, uh, which the code says is not maintenance, uh, we do feel that that um, uh, is due to landowner decisions. Okay. And one quick other question. Is the current sign lit? And is, does this change in some fundamental way the amount of lighting or anything with regards to traffic or other buildings adjacent to it and that sort of thing? Sure. Uh, the, in the applicant's materials, they said that it was only lit by flood, by floodlights. Uh, however, I, th I thought that there were electrical components within the sign. Uh, at the bottom of the sign, there's a, a junction box, which I, th I felt was for lighting the sign. Maybe that just doesn't work anymore. Um, but you know, as part of a maintenance, you know, upgrading, uh, you know, uh, broken or old lighting lighting uh, elements could be uh, replaced. Okay. Because I thought I saw something in their submission that they were upgrading to more efficient way of illumination through LED versus however it was illuminated previously um, and would that then be maintenance to go with a more energy efficient method of showing off your business sure. name mr. Bussey Councilmember Nelson um, the converting you know whatever the whatever's in the sign whether it's incandescent or some other older technology converting that to uh, LED technology that's done with some regularity and so that would be considered maintenance Council, if there's no additional questions, I know we have Peter Schmidt on the phone, uh, who's an applicant in this, and so I'd like to, uh, if we could, Mr. Sable, bring him in now and hear what he has to say on all this. Hi there, can you hear me? We can indeed, Mr. Schmidt. Good evening, welcome. Yeah. Well, good evening. Well, thank you all for um, hearing this. Um, we are excited to be in Bloomington. I was just down there this evening and I wish I actually came in person. What an exciting meeting you've had so far. <laughs> They're all um, like this, Mr. Schmidt, trust me. They're all like this. I can't wait for the next one. Yes. It's been so riveting. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't have, I don't have much more to add. You know, we are excited to be coming to Bloomington, and we were hoping to have the opportunity to have an electronic message center, not only to share with the community what are the happenings at Schmidt, but also, you know, share and celebrate um, things that happen in the community with specifically schools, uh, their bands and orchestras. And um, this will be one of the ways that we could do that. Now, um, you know, we, we want to preserve the stone on the outside of the building because we are required to do so. And ha having to take down this sign, I think, li limits us from being able to continue to keep that um, similar stone. So I, I understand we can tear it down. It's costly to do so and replace it. Um, so I, I, I don't see that really as an option for us at this time. But I appreciate the consideration on being able to convert the sign as is and replace it with a box um, that has the electronic message center. Well, thank you, Mr. Schmidt. And, and I, 
we'll echo your thoughts or your sentiments. We're very excited to have you here in Bloomington. Um, I, 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 for as long as I can remember, I can remember Schmidt music. And so it's great to have uh, this longtime Minnesota business uh, moving into Bloomington. So thanks much for that. Greatly appreciated. Yeah, hopefully we can help those sales tax numbers. There you go. <laughs> Council, any questions of Mr. Schmidt? House Member Lohman. Um, yeah, if you could just talk a little bit more about that, because uh, you had mentioned something, uh, uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, regarding the uh, the removal of the stone. I, could you talk a little bit more about that? That you um, can't remove that on the on the sign. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. So um, the city of Bloomington requires that um, the materials on the outside of the building have like uh, integrated color. So we're not able to paint that old stone to try to modernize the exterior of the building. So we've now embraced the stone and we're trying to work with the stone. And in order to re replace that stone, we, we don't think that that's feasible for us to go out and find, you know, stone from the 1960s and, you know, rebuild the sign to match. It would sort of be, we'd have to eliminate the old sign and start with just like a, a pylon sign, you know, a metal pole, um, as you've probably seen down the highway. Mr. Centenario, anything to add to that? Mayor Bussey, the, uh, so the, again, going to these very technical standards, the stone does not have to be preserved uh, for the sign or the building. Uh, what was at issue is uh, when Schmidt Music came in for an administrative application to do some renovations and work on the building, uh, they wanted to paint uh, the stone. And we have pretty strict limitations on painting surfaces that are unpainted. Uh, the stone as it sits is unpainted. Uh, it's a it's natural stone, uh, and they would either have to leave it as is, or they could remove it altogether and do something else that was code complying. So you could modify it briefly. You could you could cut a little off of it though, right? Certainly. Cool. Yeah. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schmidt, for being here t this evening. Um, I, I was curious. To, I'll ask you the same question I I asked Mr. Centenario. What are the what are the considerations you've made to either um, reduce the height of the cabinet that you're interested in putting the electronic board in, or reducing the height overall by lopping off, if for lack of a more elegant way to say it, some of the stone at the top of that? Well, have you considered those those as options, and and um, can you describe for us the the I guess what makes those unfe uh, unfeasible for you? Uh, so at the moment, um, I have asked our general contractor, R.J. Ryan, to work with the um, stone and masonry subcontractor to give us a proposal on taking roughly the four feet off the top of the stone so we can maintain um, the similar square footage of signage. And the only, you know, the only hindrance to us doing that is just the cost associated with it. It's a cost we were hoping not to have to incur. Okay, understood. Thank you. Yeah. And then, you know, the other the other option would be is to take four feet off of the sign, and then, you know, that would just reduce the amount of square footage we have for our signage. Sure. Council, any additional questions of either Mr. Centenario or Mr. Schmidt? So thoughts on this, Council? Um, which way to go? I... Um, I think the, you know, hearing from what, what the, hearing from the applicant is certainly helpful, but hearing what the staff and what the planning commission has brought forward as a recommendation, um, I, I can't honestly say that I've, I've heard anything that's particularly compelling to make me go against the, the staff recommendation, the planning commission recommendation. Uh, I will say, I mean, my offhand comment earlier, I, we do need to make changes to our, our digital signage uh, ordinances here in the city of Bloomington. We'll get around to that eventually. But um, I don't think this is, this isn't the time or place for that discussion. But it, it's something to keep in context and in, in mind with this one. So, uh, I mean, I as I said, I, I have not heard anything necessarily compelling here that I think would allow or, or would compel me to, to go against what the Planning Commission or the or the staff has recommended here. Councilmember D'Alessandro? A, a quick question for you on that, Mr. Mayor. The So the... I think as Mr. Centenario mentioned it, we could offer him some code modification recommendation that um, if, if desired. Um, and so 
I guess to 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 ask the question bluntly, are are you proposing that at some point in at, at this stage we would actually consider replacing a sign like this with an LED signage to be maintenance, such that because the problem here is that that's not currently the code, right? If it was the code, we we, there, we wouldn't we would no, just be approving this, right? Okay, that's correct. So so if 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 we made that change tonight and said, making one step towards our goal to be more digitally, you know, accessible here as a as a as a city, we'll we'll throw in if everything else is the same, <laughs> we'll throw we'll throw in digital signage, right, as a maintenance item as long as there's not a requirement to, for example, run new electrical or whatever. Is that something we want to entertain now? In order to support this, um, or are you saying let's let's not look at that as an option tonight? Um, I would because not. it has lots of you know. I, yeah, I'm not so. crazy about entertaining it tonight on the fly here. I think okay. uh, to, to to look at our complete sign ordinance and what it means for our digital signage and and the the other we, we've got a handful of other digital signage spots and opportunities within the city, uh, but I don't think we should probably do it on the fly tonight. I think uh, that's probably, in, in my mind, it's a asking the planning department to probably to take this up in their work plan for next year and to really kind of scrub through the code and the ordinance and make sure that we're, we're doing what we need to do. Sure. I appreciate that. I, my, my, I'm, I'm just saying that like, for me, this is such a cut and dried thing that like, if everything else is equal and all you're doing is replacing the non-digital sign with a digital sign, it's considered maintenance. That feels really cut and dried to me tonight. And I don't know if it, it, in large part because the digital signage stuff we're doing may never touch this portion of the code again because you'll be starting with digital signs that then go through maintenance, but the notion of conversion from non-digital to digital may not come about. And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. If, if other folks would be fine with that, um, I'm good. I actually would be okay with that particular one is what I'm saying. Good to know. Thanks. Mr. Centenari, you jumped up like you had something to add or? I was, Mr. Mayor, I was just going to say, uh, you know, earlier today I asked uh, Glenn Markagar, the planning manager, on what the anticipated timeline would be to have a, essentially a, a new sign code. Uh, and uh, he thought that uh, it would be by the end of the second quarter of 2023. Okay, good to know. And so we were happy to receive feedback. Sign codes are notoriously difficult. Um, you want to have something, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a really delicate balance. Yep, understood. All right, thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'm just curious as to the um, applicant and contractor's construction schedule. I mean, when would they be done? Could they wait for us to get that done? Mr. Schmidt, did you hear the question? I did hear the question, yes. Um, I, I believe that we have submitted an application for a temporary sign um, because we are planning to open up November 1st and um, we will not be able to have a sign installed by then, um, regardless if we go to a LED digital sign at this time or do the maintenance on the cabinet to replace it with a static sign. So that but I, I would be very curious to know if the sign code would change, we would potentially wait for that because it's a, it's a substantial investment either way. But I would suggest that we maybe go that path then, yeah. if you can have a temporary sign for a while. Um, Mr. Centenary, how long does a temporary sign permit allow for a temporary sign? The so we're we'll, we'll get into the weeds a little bit here. Okay. Um, <laughs> we have it already. Yeah. Well, it gets worse, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member. Uh, so we actually wouldn't process it as a temporary sign. We would actually process it as a sign face change uh, because it's and again it gets it gets really particular. But uh, we have we have specific signs and how temporary signs can be implemented. And uh, a temporary sign that would not apply to a monument sign, which is by its very nature permanent. Um, so essentially we don't have a mechanism to have a permanent sign or a temporary sign located on a permanent sign. So we would, it's just a, a processing uh, situation. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Centenario, for perhaps most clearly illustrating why a conversation about our sign code is necessary given that 
for lack of a better term, complex construction that you just outlined there. Um, I would say, based on on what I've heard and read, you know, to the mayor's point, I I have a hard time looking at um, what the applicant has put forward and calling that a, a really a, a practical difficulty or any sort of real what I would consider to be a, a real reason for a variance. Um, I I think you know the the desire for an LED, LED sign where you know we can announce band and orchestra concerts and that kind of thing that's a that's a great thing um but i i am always a little bit wary of essentially attempting to force a code change through sort of one-off variances like this um and i'm especially wary of attempting to legislate from the dais at 9 35 at night um so i i think that's probably the better approach is is call it a a, a sign phase change or a temporary sign what you know whatever sort of works for you um and then a more um all-encompassing discussion about the sign code um because i i think you know the the issues brought forward here to me just don't seem to rise to that level um that i would be comfortable granting a variance and you know i think back to i think it was the um was it the tcf bank that wanted to repaint uh their their building gray and we denied that variance as well um not so much because it was particularly challenging but because of of what we have written in our code and i think um you know we we have the code as it's written and the standards as they're sort of laid out here and i think the approach that we need to take is what we have in front of us not right now but uh, or is is what we have in front of us right now not maybe what we would like to see or what we could see um without a fuller discussion so i, I think that would be my my preference as well as to um deny the variance here tonight and and in the hopes uh that that mr mr schmidt where i have bought plenty of music books myself um will uh will be able to come to something that that uh, will work for them as well council member loman Oh, I don't need to repeat what uh, what you said, Mayor, or what Councilmember Coulter said. I think that is sound uh, judgment. The only question that I have is if there is some way that uh, in the interim uh, that uh, if they decided they didn't want to change this and wait till we have that discussion, uh, if there's any way that that, that that could happen. Mr. Mayor and Councilmember, specifically to allow an electronic well, no, obviously not the electronic sign, but you know, you you wait to, you know you put some temporary sign up, which I think what my colleagues are saying. Um, is, is there a way to go about doing that, or is that just nope? You gotta you gotta put something on this sign, and then. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Loman, no, there there are opportunities for temporary signage, uh, and you know I think you you asked how many days, temporary signs uh, can be issued within a couple days. Uh, it it really isn't a long drawn out process. And code complying signs, uh, our policy is to have them uh, reviewed and approved within five business days as our standard procedure. So I might, what you just laid out there, I could never say it again, but uh, this is getting late. <laughs> I would suggest that we go down that route um, or, or you know, allow them to go down that route so that we can really look at that sign ordinance to get it right, do it the right way, think it through, and then uh, pass it through the, 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 through the right way. But I, I think that uh, what you said, Mayor, is what we had to do. Council, any other thoughts? So we, we've got two motions here. One is regarding the the setback, which and and this is uh, the recommendation would be to ad adopt the the variance regarding the setback. And I don't think anybody's got an issue with that. And so perhaps we start with that, and then uh, if we if we move to continue this to prepare the resolution of denial uh, with the understanding that the option of a sign phase change or a temporary sign, however we want to phrase that, would be there with the, with, with the possibility, and I can't give an absolute guarantee, but the possibility that by the second quarter of next year, we would have a better understanding about what could be possible there. And then without incurring a lot of cost for the folks at Schmidt Music, they could then make adjustments once we make adjustments to the sign code. Does that all make sense, what I just said there? 
Ms. Mandershad, that doesn't make sense, does it? No, <laughs> Mayor, it makes sense to me. Um, just a clarification, we're actively working on the sign code. We're actively editing it now. Um, and I was just talking to some of the folks that are working on it. We uh, hope to get through all of the drafting this year with a plan to put it on an agenda in early 2023. So, um, you know, I mean, best laid plans. It's a very complicated code, but that's our hope and our goal. Um, and so the one question I had that I was wondering about is if there's a denial next uh, September 12th meeting, is that in any way going to um, be something that they need to be aware of for a future application? That's a great question. Um, Mr. Mayor, council members, I think uh, when we're going through these code revisions, you know, I think we're, we're receiving your guidance tonight and uh, ultimately what we want to do is to, in some ways, make the code more permissive uh, so a lot of folks can accomplish this sort of thing mm -hmm. with just a permit. Oh. Okay. So even if there is a denial next uh, in, in early September, there isn't then a provision that says we can't come back to this, or they can't come back to it within, you know, for after a minimum of six months, that kind of thing, sure, correct? Mr. Mayor, I believe because the code would be different Okay. And so uh, if the code's different and they're compliant with the code, the, the need for a variance would be moot. Got it. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So long as there's a new, a new code, new set of rules, new, mm -hmm. yeah. Gonna, yep. Okay. Is everybody clear what we're talking here? Council Member Carter and then Council Member Lohman. Council Member Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So just to clarify, if he were to be denied at the next meeting and then comes back with a request for a temporary or whatever it's called, um, Requests. I mean, he'd still he'd be fine then because he's not asking for a variance. That's correct. Okay, yeah. just want to make sure. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, there's 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 other opportunities to have something on a more of a temporary basis that does not require a variance. Yep. Council Member Loman, did you have a question? Well, I was ready to move it. If if let's, we're let's get a question from Council Member Nelson, and then we'll go with that. Council Member Nelson. Um. Yeah, I was just wondering if if there's any possibility for them to just withdraw the variance, and if that would be more advantageous to them. Uh, for any reason, and if they'd be open to that. Although they need the 20 foot one, right? They need the 20 foot one, yeah. Ms. Mandershed? The other portion. Oh, Mayor members, it's my understanding that if there is a denial, that they would be prevented from submitting again for this same variance for a year. Um, what we're talking about is that they would be applying for something in the future under a new code. So we don't know what that new code is. They don't know what it is. They don't know what they're going to be applying for. Um, so it's hard to know. Um, but if the applicant wants to uh, pull back its uh, application for this particular part of it, um, it they, the applicant can certainly do that. But to your point, I don't think it would necessarily preclude it because we're going to be Assuming we're going to be we're going to be working under a new code. Any other questions, clarifications here? Kind of went around the block and back again on this one, again. Councilmember Lohman, Mayor, I'd like to move to adopt a resolution approving a variance to the freestanding sign setback requirements for existing freestanding sign at 7800 Picture Drive. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Coulter to adopt the resolution approving variances to a freestanding sign setback requirements. Any further council discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Lohman. Having, having been unable to make the required findings in section 2.85.04G1C and E, and in sections 28504G to C, I move to continue consideration to the September 12th, 2020 City Council meeting and direct staff to prepare a resolution of denial for a variance to freestanding height requirements for an existing freestanding sign at 7800 Picture Drive. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Coulter to uh, continue consideration of this item until September 12th and direct staff to prepare a resolution of denial for a variance. Further council discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 
Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Mr. Schmidt, um, I, I, there, there's, I think, possibilities on the horizon for you. I, 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 I would like to continue this conversation and, and your input, I think, as we continue to work toward uh, a, a much better sign code here in the city of Bloomington would be appreciated. Well, I thank you very much all for your time and effort on this matter. Thank you. Item 4.2 tonight is a public hearing, our first public hearing of the evening. This regarding public pool and lodging code amendments. Lynn Moore from Environmental Health. Good evening, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the city of Bloomington has maintained a contract with the Minnesota Department of Health since 1987. In this contract, which we last updated in 2010, um, it officially delegates the Minnesota Department of Health's authority to license and inspect food service and lodging establishments and public pools. As part of the delegation agreement, the Minnesota Department of Health periodically assesses our programs and makes recommendations. And we went through this process just a couple months ago. So the three things that, um, very minor things that are proposed are not adopting by reference Minnesota rules 4717.3975 for public pool variances and 4717.0450 for public pool plan review. Both of these things fall under MDH authority. Um, the second thing that we're updating is just the variance language for food and lodging establishments, just making it easier to read, not really changing what it means. And then the third thing is removing language on public pool plan review by the local health authority, and by that we mean in the Environmental Health Division, in Chapter 14 and Appendix A. Even though the city code uh, currently explains that we were only reviewing items MDH's state pool engineer was not reviewing on existing pools, for example, replacing a fence or something, the Department of Health requested that we remove this language from our city code. So um, MDH staff review reviewed and approved these proposed code amendments in July, and there's no real impact on city licensees from these changes um, to the code requirements. So they're pretty just little things the State Department of Health asked us to update and, and do. Um, I have received no comments um, uh, on these amendments, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So in a nutshell, clean up at the request of the Minnesota Department of Health. Exactly. <coughs> Council, any questions of Ms. Moore on this one? <coughs> no, seeing any hands going up. That being the case, uh, this is a public hearing, and I will open a public hearing on item 4.2 regarding public pool and lodging code amendments. Anyone in the council chambers wishes to speak to item 4.2? I see no one coming forward. Mr. Sable, do we have anyone on the phone? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, we have no one on the phone. We have no one on the phone and no one in the Council Chambers Council. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.2. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Coulter, second by Council Member Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.2. No further Council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Council, any thoughts on this? As I said, it uh, sounds like kind of Clean up at the request of the Department of Health, kind of mundane kind of stuff that we just need to get in compliance with everything. Councilmember Coulter. Mayor, I'm, I'm happy to make a motion here. I will move to adopt an ordinance aligning public pool plan review and lodging establishment variance procedures with state requirements, thereby amending Chapter 14 and Appendix A of the City Code. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Martin to adopt the ordinance aligning public pool plan review and lodging establishment variance procedures set forth in the city code. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Council Member Coulter, summary publication. Thank you, Mayor. I will move to adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance aligning public pool plan review and lodging establishment variance procedures, <coughs> excuse me, with state requirements, thereby amending chapter 14 and appendix A of the city code. Second. Motion by Council Member Coulter, second by Council Member Martin for summary publication on item 4.2. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7 0. 
Item 4.3 on our agenda is another public hearing, this regarding a shared vehicle ordinance update. Mr. Hanson, good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. No problem. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. I'm back before you again this evening to discuss the shared vehicle ordinance update. Um, for a little background, next slide, please. Um, just a little talk about a little bit about our, our, our code as it relates to shared vehicles um, and kind of where we're at and how we got to this point. So in July 2020, um, we adopted uh, section 17.68 of the city code to allow shared vehicles to operate within the city of Bloomington. Um, in that code section, we defined three development districts, the South Loop, Penn American, and Normandale Lakes District as the only districts that shared vehicles could operate within. Um, in fall 2021, we were approached by Bird Incorporated, um, who was interested in deploying their dockless scooters in the city of Bloomington. Uh, staff worked with Bird um, through fall in the spring of 2022 to draft a memorandum of understanding. Um, and entered into that agreement in the spring of 2022 with Bird to allow them to deploy their shared vehicle dockless scooters in Bloomington in those three districts. <clears throat> Shortly after uh, that MOU, excuse me, that MOU was uh, entered into, uh, Bird reached out to the city with concerns about the uh, restricted areas of operation for their vehicles. And uh, after some um, conversations with their team, um, inquired about expanding those areas um, for their their use here in Bloomington, which kind of brought us to the next slide, please. Um, in May, you may remember, I was before you um, as a study item to discuss the possibility of expanding the zones of operation for shared vehicles in Bloomington. Um, had a couple uh, of things for your consideration. One was to keep the code as is. Um, another option was to allow them to operate throughout the city, um, throughout the entire city. A third was kind of a more uh, restricted approach, but to expand some of the zones and make some other zones available. And after some discussion with the council, there was kind of two schools of thought. One was to allow them in a kind of expanded uh, identified zones area. The other was to allow them throughout the entire city. And uh, staff, or the council instructed staff to reach out and engage the, the members of the community to see what their input would be and come back before you, which brings us to where we are tonight. Um, I'm sorry, can we go back to one slide? I got a little bit in my head of myself there. Um, so in June 2022, um, staff worked with our co-ed uh, department to put together a Let's Talk Bloomington page um, to seek some input from the community on what they, their thoughts were on shared vehicles and how they like to see them operate in Bloomington. Um, we did have that page live for about a month um, and co-ed had a, uh, a board up at the nine uh, park planning events with that QR code on it to let that allowed people, I know that many of you were attended those events as well, to uh, use that QR code to go, excuse me, right to that Let's Talk Bloomington page to provide uh, input on uh, the, the uh, Let's Talk Bloomington page there. Um, we had 88 total visits on our Let's Talk Bloomington page, so not quite the response we were hoping, um, but we did have 88 people that did visit. Um, and with that, we ha asked a handful of questions. We had about, I think we had nine questions, and then we also had a uh, pin map where they could drop pins on where they would like to take their scooters or shared vehicles, I should say, in Bloomington. And I'll show a couple of those the next slide, please. So a couple of questions I highlighted. I gave the entire Let's Talk Bloomington results were included in your, in your packet and your agenda materials, but a couple of questions I just want to point out here was the one in the upper left there, it was a question about um, where would you like to see them placed throughout Bloomington? And the two options were to allow them to operate throughout the entire city. And the other option was to allow them to only operate in a defined area. And as you can see, majority of the respondents, granted very low number compared to, you know, as we had our statistics class earlier today, um, did want to allow them to operate within the entire city. So the second question I kind of wanted to highlight was where would you use these shared bikes or scooters in Bloomington? And the, the highest, uh, the response, they could click any that applied, was for recreation, as you might imagine. But I did want to point out that there was um, you know, considerable interest, relatively speaking, in utilizing these for trips within the neighborhood, also with commuting and making those last mile trips from transit. So uh, a good distribution there. Um, next slide, please. Another, another question we asked was, where would you like to see uh, where would you like to visit using these shared vehicles? Again, I believe only one person, full disclosure, responded to this pin map question. So this is one person's idea of where they want to go in Bloomington. But since I wanted to show this, it does at least show that there's interest throughout the entire city and not one defined area, um, which kind of uh, helped lead to the recommendation you'll be seeing tonight for the code update. So uh, next slide, please. 
So with that, uh, take the information into account. Um, staff uh, is before you this evening with a proposed code amendment that would essentially um, remove the three development districts that were identified in the original code and replace that with a shared vehicle operation zones map. Um, and I'll show that to you in a second. And this, uh, this code language mirrors what we have, uh, what we utilize for our parking zone map in section 8.40 of the city code. So taking the language we used in our approved parking zone map and kind of mirroring that for this idea for a shared vehicles operation zones map. Um, next slide, please. So this would allow us to codify any areas where we want to restrict uh, operations through bringing this map back before council and having it approved as opposed to going through a code amendment every time. Um, this is what the map would look like. As you can see right now, we have one area identified as prohibited, and that's the Mall of America. The reason being is when we initially, or when Bird initially was thinking about deploying in the South Loop District, we had, meeting, we had a meeting between the Mall of America representatives, city staff, and Bird and the mall um, indicated their desire to not have these shared vehicles allowed on their property. Um, and so that is why you see that area outlined right now, and that would be something that, if this was to be approved, uh, would be codified with this uh, shared vehicles operation zones map. Um, one advantage to having this map um, is that it allows us, like I mentioned before, to codify anything and not have to go through, uh, just bring the map back for approval to the council. Um, and also, we still uh, maintain our ability to be nimble and um, you know, address areas as they come up through the geofencing technology. So again, the memorandum of understanding that we have with BIRD that expires at the end of this year, um, they have up to five business days at the request of the city to update the geofencing. So say we had an area where there is an issue and we wanted to restrict shared vehicles in that area, we could reach out to BIRD. We could still have that change made and then come back later and codify that if need be. Or if it was something that just popped up and we wanted to just uh, address it in the short term and maybe allow those shared vehicles to come back in the future, we'd have the ability to do that too. So it'd really be at the discretion um, of the council how they would want to do that if we want to codify it or utilize our geofencing tools and some of the language that we have in our current MOU um, to address those types of issues. So just because we'd be going to the shared vehicle operation zones map uh, model if it was to be approved, we would still have the ability to you know, make spot uh, restrictions as needed or as desired by uh, staff or council or private businesses as well. Uh, next slide. So um, with that, uh, I have some suggested motions for you. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Otherwise, the, the full code language is included in your agenda materials this evening. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Council members, Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I believe the last time we talked about this, we um, talked a little bit about maybe considering like the first year, depending on the approach, a pilot year, and then revisiting based on you know, the data, um, the geofencing data, any resident complaints that we get, is that still the plan? Yeah, and thank you. I, and I should have mentioned too, I apologize. Um, on the, we do have joining us this evening um, via WebEx if there's questions. Uh, uh, Camille, I'm hoping I'm saying your last name correctly. I've just realized I'm just saying this out loud for the first time. Uh, Didio, uh, she's a senior account executive with Bird, and I've been uh, in conversations with her, so she's available to answer any questions. But Bird's uh, intention in talking with Camille before tonight's meeting is, if the changes are approved, um, they would still like to deploy yet this year in Bloomington um, for a couple months. So the current MOU expires. Um, the vehicles are allowed to be in place through November 15th of this year, and then it, it expires March 1st, 2023. At that point, we could enter into a new MOU. So yes, if there were things, if they did deploy yet this year and we saw things they wanted to add into our MOU in the next year, we'd have that ability to do that. So we would up that every year, and that would be for not only Bird or for any other provider wanted to come to the city. And we would also have, through BIRD, um, the ability, we'd have a dashboard to be able to look at you know, some of that information, so we'd be able to process that and kind of analyze that and see if we want to make any changes in our MOU in the coming years. Okay, great. And then that dashboard, does that include, is that BIRD's dashboard? Or yes, the city's? Okay, it is BIRD's so dashboard, yes. Could we give, well, would we also then include our own data? For example, I assume that you would be tracking any kind of resident complaints or, um, or residents just saying hey this is amazing make sure you keep this program but um i assume that we would that would be combined then as do we look at kind of the overall yes staff would take into account the data that we're collecting on the city side as well okay. as the information provided through okay. correct thank you but you make a good point council member that it, it, yes it would be nice to collect whatever data if they deployed next week and through november 15th but i would like to see a full year's worth of uh data but to see if we have any issues then as well so should do that council member d'alessandro 
Good evening. Good evening. Well, thanks for being here. <clears throat> I know we talk about this as updating uh, shared vehicle language. So what other shared vehicles would, what would this map restrict and or enable for other types of shared vehicles? Uh, I'm wondering, for example, you know, does, does the definition of shared vehicles include vehicles for which this map would not apply? Potentially, um, or it, w if the if the shared vehicle didn't have the same technology available to it that we're kind of assuming is part of this notion of of um, the map, mm -hmm. how do we handle that? I'm curious what you've thought of there. Sure. Thanks. So, um, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, uh, the shared vehicles is a defined term, and I apologize, I don't have that language in front of me right now, um, but it would apply to so. When you think of shared vehicles, we're talking about scooters in the case of Bird. That would that could also you know apply to electronic bikes, those type of things. So anything that's defined as a shared vehicle in our city code would fall underneath this map. And if the, are you? I guess my question is: Are you requiring then, as part of either on purpose or by accident, that anybody who would maybe want to consider running a shared vehicle program in the city of Bloomington have the ability to geofence? Correct. Uh, that would be, that is part, that, would, that is language that's included in our memorandum of understanding. So that would be something that we would include in any MOU with any shared vehicle provider. Um, I am not aware of any shared vehicle providers at this point that don't have the ability to geofence. I guess if we came to that point, um, we would have to look at the at the shared vehicle map and how that would apply to them if they were to apply um, to be an operator under okay. a shared vehicle. Yeah, so, I'm just, it, yeah. it's implicit in what you're attempting to do here that y you are limiting, not in a bad way necessarily, but you're limiting the potential providers in the city of Bloomington to those folks who can comply with this map. Correct. Okay. Do we, I just wanted to make sure we all were clear on that. Yep. Thanks. Which, Not that I'm necessarily yeah, opposed. But. Yeah, which is, I don't think is a terrible thing. If, uh, if we're going to, I mean, if the Mall of America is saying no, you, we don't want uh, shared vehicles on our property. That as a private property, they can say that, and so we would expect that of any. Well, and I guess operator. the implication that I'm, I'm making there is: should we be more explicit then? That our code requires geofencing capability for anybody who wants to participate, as opposed to doing it on a memo OU to memo U kind of basis, because we're essentially doing that anyway by by enforcing this map as part of code, but we're not explicitly saying that you have to be able to like manage to this map as part of code. So I just throw that out there for consideration. And I would note too that uh, the city code does require memorandum of understanding to be entered into between the shared vehicle provider and the city. So within that memorandum of understanding, we can re we've been requiring or are requiring that geofencing technology. So I guess. Right. Okay. Fair enough. I you know you can get one way or you can get there one way or right. the other. But if we're if we're gonna if we're trying to avoid updating code by pulling this all into a map, mm. then I'm just wondering if the code should reference the map as enforceable in some way so that people understand that it has to be electronically enforceable by their product. I don't know. It, it, if you think that's not required, that's fine by me. Um, it just feels uh, like we should just be explicit about that in code if that's what we're trying to do here. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, two uh, quick questions. With the, the geofencing capability over in the south loop there, is that specific enough so that if I'm riding a scooter along 24th or Old Shakopee on the edge of that property, is it going to shut the scooter off? I'm thinking for folks going from the hotels in south loop west, would they be able to get through there? Right. Um, and I might defer that question to Camille and the bird staff on their technology, but it's our understanding and talking with them previously and the mall that that geofence would be set um, at the property line. So if they were on the roadway or within the right of way, the, the, the vehicle would not turn off on them, yes. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Um, and then in uh, neighborhoods, I'm thinking a lot of blocks on the east side um, that don't have sidewalks, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, under our current code would you be able to leave a scooter in a neighborhood like that if you're done with it? Yeah, so you can leave it in the right of way. Um, 
in the right of way, um, but you can't be. There's certain furnished, there's certain areas where you're not allowed to leave it, and that's in the MOU as well. So yeah. they can't leave it in the middle of an intersection, you know, somewhere where it's causing an issue. But if it's on the public right of way, you know, on on a grassy area in a public right of way, it would be able to be left there. Yes. Okay. Does that include people's yards? If it's part of the right of way, they could put them there. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Councilmember Nelson, and then uh, maybe we'll get to Camille and get her input on the uh, the geofencing question. Councilmember Nelson. So um, based on what you said earlier, Mayor, my understanding would be any business that didn't want these could let us know and say, hey, put us on the do not use list. Is that that's accurate? Is there I, I would think that would be, I mean, if, if uh, Cross Anderson said we don't want those at Southtown, I think, I mean, it's a privately owned business, privately owned parcel of property. I think we'd have to comply with that. Okay. Um, and then uh, along those lines, have we spoken with Three Rivers Park District? if they want them within their uh, areas? Uh, we have not yet because uh, to date the, the zones would not have allowed them in there. So that would be a conversation that would take place if the, um, if, if the code was to be amended and there would be a poss potentially allowed in there, we would reach out to them, yes. Okay, and then have we talked to the city of Bloomington about its parks? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could see some serious conflicts with these being in in our parks, mm -hmm. and that would be a concern to me, having them running through Dred Scott or something like that with, you know, kids run, walking around. I mean, around the perimeter, yeah, but on the trails going straight mm -hmm. through that when it's busy and things, I, I think those would be used conflicts. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, very popular trail down by Nine Mile Creek where bikes and scooters aren't supposed to be, but I have heard that sometimes people don't always follow rules. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, I, I just I think those are things we would want to look at too to manage those conflicts in terms of the geofencing. And and uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, those are things. So just from our process standpoint, if the uh, the next step in the pro the uh, bird has a memorandum of understanding with uh, executed with the city. So prior to them being able to deploy, they need to enter into a right of way encroachment agreement, or excuse me, right of way encroachment permit. And when they do that, the one thing we'll look at is we will look at the geofencing and we'll need to confirm that that is, uh, we're, it meets all of our standards and what we wanna see before we'll issue that permit so they can actually deploy. So those are conversations that we will have prior to that permit being issued. We'll reach out to our park and rec department through the original park district as well to make sure. And if they are telling us they don't want those in there, we'll make sure that geofencing is in place over those areas prior to that permit being issued for them to deploy. Okay. Um, and also just the national park probably. Mm -hmm. No, and I think it goes back to Councilmember Carter's earlier comment about a year trial to figure out where this is working, where it's not working. If there's conflicts or problems, then we can adjust accordingly. Any additional questions? Otherwise, I think uh, uh, Camille from Bird is on the line and like to hear if she has anything to add regarding the, the questions we have about geofencing and the, the specifics that are possible. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Camille, as you know. Um, and yeah, I, I have a couple things I want to just touch on just from hearing the discussion. I, I need the, the question repeated about the geofencing particularly, but um, as Brian has, has stated, we, we can make this as proactive or reactive as you guys really want. So if that means geofencing off zones before we or areas before we even launch, we can do that. If we start to launch and then we, you know, we get a complaint in a certain area and it's becoming an ongoing issue, we can set, uh, you know, no ride zones as we go as well. So we want to make this really as hands on as as possible. Um, as for the year trial, this is typically what we do with every every city is run that that 12 month trial, see how things are going. You guys can actually gain all of that data um, with that built out dashboard completely. Uh, customizable to Bloomington. Um, so you'll be able to see different things like heat maps, um, ridership trends, how long and where people are riding to and from, different things like that. Um, and so we usually like to spend that first year to uh, evaluate how it's going and then we'll re reconsider a renewal after that first year. So that's to answer that question. Um, and then I'd love, I'd love to have just uh, whoever asked, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the geofencing area uh, question um, to to repeat that so I can I can more accurately accurately understand. I, I think what the question was um, 
for example, if there if there's a private parcel, the Mall of America, the sidewalks on the Mall of America side of the street, I'm assuming they wouldn't work, but on the sidewalks on the other side of the street or in the street, they would work. Uh, if people were going from, you know, around or past the mall, they're not going to, they're not going to be geofenced out of operation, are they? No, totally. So it's it's down to the specific latitude and longitude of that geo geofenced okay. area. So we would essentially just put that around around the Mall of America, but those 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 streets around it, they would still be operable. So like Twenty Fourth Ave South would be operable all around there, but just not, not in the Mall of America, if that makes sense. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Council, any other questions of Camille here, Councilmember Loman? Well, maybe, maybe it's not of her, um, maybe it's more of staff here. My, my one question is, if um, uh, someone didn't want the, uh, the device in front of their right-of-way, is there any way to, any process that we would have to prevent that from happening? Yes, and I, and I can let Camille speak to that again, but I'm, 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 I'm very, fairly confident that they can put uh, no ride end zone, so a ride could not end in that area, so a rider... Um, the, the, the vehicle would still be operational, so they'd need to move it to another area to be able to end their ride. And Camille can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yes, that's correct, Brian. And what would our, and maybe we can ha handle this later on. I know we're get, getting into, into the weeds here. Um, and I don't need to an answer for this right now, but I'd like to know what that process looks like uh, for if, 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 if an individual resident would say, hey, you know what, I really don't want that in, in front of my, my property, even on the right of way. Yeah, I can I can speak to this. I appreciate the question. Um, so essentially, there's a, there's a couple different ways that we can we can implement no park zones. Um, that's the city does have a, an account manager, um, so that's a point of contact here at Bird that will be there for your day to day issues, your proactive reactive program solutions, anything you guys might need. But then also there's a way to report things within the app um, without you even needing to be a Bird user. So you just download the Bird app, and there's something called uh, a community mode and so somebody can actually go on there uh, even in reg regardless if you're a, a bird user and you can go, you can issue a complaint and that will go directly to the fleet manager that we contract out which is a, a local contracted worker within Bloomington uh, usually in the form of a business owner or a local entrepreneur that's running the the operation there in town um, and they will be prompted to go pick that up in a timely manner we usually do give them uh, no more than one hour per hour uh, standards to go pick those up. So if any complaints do come in, they go directly to that local fleet manager um, who will then, uh, you know, go out and, and solve the issue. That Thanks for that clarification. Uh, so uh, it's it's handled privately, not it doesn't go to the city. Thanks. Right. And, and yeah. I would, and um, uh, council member, I will note too that in the MOU right now, there is language in there that says that does, if we do contact them or they're contacted, it needs to be, um, move within 24 hours. It sounds like Camille said that would happen much sooner than that, but um, we have that in there. And obviously, if the city needs to uh, um, uh, pick up a scooter and, and impound it, we have language in there to that as well. So hoping we never get to that point. Yeah, we hold our, our fleet managers to some pretty strict standards. So obviously, we want these picked up and, and it, you know, the issues resolved as quick as possible. Um, so usually it's, it's one to two hours that we'll give them, um, when complaints come in, but, but obviously this, the sooner, the better, um, in our, in our case. Council, any additional questions? If not, I'm going to open this public hearing item 4.3. This is a public hearing on the shared vehicle ordinance update. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.3? No one coming forward. Mr. Sable, do we have anyone on the line to speak to item 4.3? Mr. Mayor, council members, no one is on the line. Last call in the council chambers. Council, no one coming forward, no one on the phone. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.3. So moved. Motion by council member Martin, second by council member Carter to close the public hearing on item 4.3. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries at 7-0. Council, any additional questions or comments? Councilmember Martin and then Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor, uh, and thank you for the additional information on the presentation and, and Camille's attendance. Um, I, I'll say my thinking hasn't changed substantially on this since the last time we had the conversation, and I won't belabor the point. I, I love the idea of, of leveraging this network to get uh, to our various commercial areas, to go from points of density to points of density, and to welcome visitors to our community, folks staying in the hotels who don't have a vehicle, use this to come see the rest of Bloomington. Uh, but a, as of now, from what I've seen, I don't think it makes sense necessarily to, to flood the zone citywide, especially because 
even though this will be dealt with in a private manner to pick the scooters up, everybody's going to call the city of Bloomington. When they see these things sitting out there, they have a problem. We're going to have to educate them. Go download a private company's app to handle what's sitting in your front yard right now. Um, I, I think this, this certainly makes sense in a targeted way, uh, but I can't support uh, doing citywide right now. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Well, Council Member Martin kind of stole my bit because I was going to say virtually the same thing. Um, I, I mean, I can support the code change. I think that's a, a fine way to construct the code. I think it, it certainly makes it operationally easier. Um, but, you know, much the way I was in, in May, I, you know, for and for the many of the same reasons that, that Council Member Martin just stated, um, I'm, I'm not going to support the resolution in, in adopting the, the operation zones map um, for, for those reasons. And because, as, as I said then, I think it is, generally speaking, much harder to tell folks you can't do something that you could previously do than it is to tell folks you can do something that you previously couldn't. And to that end, I think we would be better we would be better served by ad adopting a map that is, for lack of a better term, more restrictive. And then, as that as the situation develops, as residents and businesses become more familiar with and you know i think to the point that was made earlier yes we primarily talked about bird but this could be other shared vehicles this could be dock bikes and and that sort of thing as folks become more familiar with those vehicles i could see that map becoming less restrictive but i just i don't think this is the right approach um at this time, I think, you know, we have cordoned off the Mall of America. That's probably a wise choice. I'm sure there are other private properties, other proper, other, other private businesses and residents that would prefer their homes and, and businesses not, not have these vehicles on them. Um, I think Council Member Nelson's point about our city parks and, and Three Rivers and the Wildlife Refuge, that's, those are good points as well. Um, again, I, I think my concern is if we're saying, you know, for now, you can take your scooter, your scooter through Dred Scott or Highland or wherever until we stop you. The problem is then we're going to have, we're going to have, I mean, we're going to have scooters probably not inside Highland, but right outside Highland. And so I think it would just be a better approach to go uh, more restrictive to less restrictive. And so... Um, I, like I said, at this point, I can support the code change. I will not be supporting the resolution uh, in favor of the zones map. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So I guess I have a clarifying question for staff. Um, uh, I guess, I, so we are, the proposal in front of us is to approve this map, yet I also heard that it's kind of going to be an iterative process. And I also think I heard you say that um, it allows you to make changes to the geofencing before coming back to council to reapprove a map, right? So, like in a year, you could come back and say, "We did all. We had all this data. We got complaints in these areas. We started doing some geofencing, and now where we're at is this is actually what the map looks like. Like we're not in three rivers. We're not on the, in the river bottoms." We're not around these businesses. We've realized we can't go through these parks. And like, this is the new map now. So is that what I'm understanding? So even though we're approving this map, it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be geofencing. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, that is correct. And I guess uh, point of clarification. So there's two actions before you this evening. One is to make the change to the, the city code, the amendment to the city code, to uh, remove those development districts as the only areas and to approve um, the language that would include an approved zones map. So I guess my question, and maybe I'd look to, I don't know if we made, if the council were to approve the, the code amendment and not approve the map where that leaves us, because now we don't have an approved map that we're referencing in our newly adopted code. I think that could be an issue. But Ms. Mandershain? Uh, Mayor members, uh, in anticipation of this question, uh, Maureen and I have been talking, uh, and it's Maureen's uh, suggestion that 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 if there is no map uh, adopted, then there are no places that scooters can go. 
and, and back to your point, uh, Councilmember Carter, you're correct. So the idea with having this approved zones map is that it would be iterative, like you said. So as changes come, it would come back before council for approval, and that would be, um, you know, be a kind of a living document that would change and evolve as the needs and the issues arose, or you know, areas wanted to be opened or closed. That would that we would have that ability. And then, as I mentioned before, we also would have the ability to react quicker using our geofencing technology through the MOU if there were certain areas. So to that point, yes, we would still have the ability to restrict certain areas, not have it codified, but still be able to address them um, if they were to come up if the council were to approve the amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hansen. That's super helpful. Um, and I guess when, if if uh, this were to move forward tonight, when would you anticipate actually turning on the scooters citywide and and having the conversations with Three Rivers and? Mm -hmm. Um, actually, uh, we have a meeting uh, scheduled. I have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with Bird um, pending the outcome of tonight's uh, council meeting to discuss next steps. Um, based on the feedback I received tonight, um, I would definitely reach out to Three Rivers, talk with our Bloomington Parks um, uh, staff, as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife before issuing that uh, right-of-way obstruction permit to allow them to operate, uh, to get that feedback from them. And if those uh, entities wanted those areas restricted, we would make sure that was included in that geofencing that we would have to review and approve before that permit would be issued. So it would be a matter of contacting those entities, turning that around, and then uh, working with BIRD um, as far as how quickly they, they want to start to roll out. So. Okay. Well, thank you again, Mr. Hansen. I would say that I am supportive of this approach and in this map. Um, in my mind, I really am thinking about this as kind of a pilot phase. I can't remember what the woman from Bert, um, Bird said that they called it. Um, but I think that the more data that we can collect across the city, the better informed we are going to be moving forward. And I do believe that, um, I mean, I just, I feel like there are many instances where we face challenges as a council because we're so rigid in our prescription of what's allowed and what's not allowed that sometimes I think we do need to take a little bit of a more flexible approach so that we can learn and and for this specifically treat it as a learning phase and um, where we can apply those learnings to future uh, maps that we would adopt via re resolution and so I am supportive I think it's a really exciting opportunity for our community um, I I don't have major concerns about things going really far sideways uh, based on what you're telling me that we're you're going to be getting data in real time and you'll you will be able to make quick adjustments so for example if we have 20 residents calling in a week about scooters on their streets or whatever we can staff can have those conversations and make those adjustments and then that's more data for us as a council to then inform our decisions in the future so that's where i'm at Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Loman. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Quick question for you, sorry. <laughs> Didn't make you just getting ready to no. sit down. Right. Apologies. No problem. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, just to understand how I'm looking at this map, um, the green means what? Oh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member. That's, that's just the background of the map. That's just showing parked areas. So the only restricted areas are that highlighted in red, and that was for... Um, the purposes of, of okay. putting that on the map for you guys. That's okay, it, yes. great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yep. Um, I, I'm assuming it was clear to everybody but me, no. um, but I'm looking at this going, I still don't understand how we're going to connect these things to each other. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's still a question, but it's not for you tonight. <laughs> um, okay, that's uh, that's helpful. So um, uh, I'm, of the, I'm of the opinion that... Um, that we take stuff away from folks all the time based on new code developments. So I understand the concerns about opening it up too far and then squeezing it down. I don't think that that's um, I don't think that that's a practical reality here because, uh, for example, we we do that when we take a two lane or a four lane road and turn it into a three lane road, for example, or other things like that. I think it's common in in the evolution of a of a city to make changes. We took out a parking restrict or parking requirements. So we literally took a half a parking space away from every one bedroom apartment going forward, right? So we do that. Um, so I, I, I'm 
100 percent okay with this. I'm I'm actually kind of interested in this data and a number of another level. I I probably understand why the Mall of America wants to cordon itself off, but I'm wondering how long that's going to last when they figure out how many people don't go there uh, because they can't use the scooters. So we'll see. We'll see by the data, right? So that's what's cool about getting the data. Um, uh, how often do you suspect that you would want to come to us with a revised map in the first year, given that um, we will be mo making most of the changes based on first year data? Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, um, my anticipation is if uh, the code amendment is to be uh, adopted this evening, working with Bird, if they are able to roll out yet this year, we'll have some data. Um, I think if we have some hot spots, they will most likely reveal themselves pretty quickly. And then exactly. my thought would be that uh, if there are some of those spots that you know we have to do some geofencing on right away, I would come back to council um, in the winter to codify those areas, have that discussion, and have that set up for the spring. So um, assuming Bird or any other provider wants to come back and deploy the following spring, enter in those MOUs, we would have that revised map to move forward with it. Great. That, that brings up the final question that I, or comment that I kind of have, which is I, I, knowing that this is, the map is a living, breathing thing, um, and knowing that um, on, uh, I'm assuming Bird can provide this electronically to us at any time, in real time, like on our website, where somebody could look it up to the moment. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we want to put in a provision here at all that says this map needs to be updated within X number of you know months or whatever, or on an interval of something, so that the map that's static, that's in the code, is is it's always going to be behind what we're actually doing in real time. So at at the risk of having <laughs> our staff come back every week, oh, it's updated again, it's updated again, it's, which is which is literally defeating the purpose of bird having geofencing in real time. Um, how do we do that in the code so that this is not literally wrong five days after we launch it? I, I just want I want to throw out that as a consideration. Ms. Manderson? Oh, you can feel free to contribute as well. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of confusion here. The map is different than an MOU, correct? The MOU might draw unique boundaries for a particular company, which is an agreement between the city and that company where they're going to be or not be. Whereas this resolution map says in the entire city, this is where these shared vehicles can and cannot be broadly speaking, right? Correct, yes, okay. yes. Okay, that's very helpful, yes. and, and that's a really important con, uh, consideration, which is we're, we're going to depend on the operational agreement between us and the vendor to determine where they can and cannot operate. What we're saying in this map is simply that, that um, we're not precluding any one vendor by virtue of this map from operating anywhere in the city. But by MOU, we could as often as we wanted to, basically meaning that their geofencing operational plan would would determine that. And if I may add, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, I I'm looking at this next, if we were, if Bird is to able to, or decides to roll out yet this year, is to use that as kind of a trial to understand how quickly, how often we need to make those changes and, and as staff have some more understanding and a better way of uh, moving forward, moving, you know, if we need to add language or MOU in subsequent years to address things that we, didn't think about until they got rolling. I would anticipate these next two months if Bird's able to roll out um, to be that kind of learning period for our staff as well. Very good, super helpful, thank you. I'm 100% supportive and I'm excited. Councilmember Lohman. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not 100% uh, excited about this. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm quite, quite nervous about this, but I, I do re recall a number of us getting together um, uh, you know, several months ago about trying to make the city a more remarkable place. And uh, I think I think um, this is part of it is trying to take uh, take this piece on and, and trying to trying to look at this and trying new new ways. You know, we did do this with the fountains, um, with the, with the fountain restrictions with the ponds. Uh, we did say let's just open it up and then let's you know look at trying to narrow it down. I was not in favor of that. Um, you know what? My old dog can change and <laughs> evolve. <laughs> I, I I can go for this if. What we're doing is between now and when this map comes out, we can really have a discussion and limit the places where it doesn't make sense. Have a good outreach uh, with with churches, um, 
uh, with uh, parks and that type of thing and, and really kind of come and have a, you know, a more reasonable map. But to me, a whole city being open like that, I, I just, I don't feel comfortable with that. I think there's some spots in here that we need to kind of curtail and have one last look at this um, and, and kind of kind of make some sense out of it, you know, going through the middle of the parks. Uh, no, nah, I, don't, I don't like that idea at all. But I, I do think that, you know, uh, that this is really a really good idea. I think we had we had a <laughs> as as much as I want, I shake my head uh, at saying that, but I think we had a had to try this. You know, um, <laughs> I, I'm definitely nervous about it, but you know, hey, let, let's let's give it a shot. Um, I think um, our residents are looking for us to try new things. They're they're uh, they're asking us to try different things, and um, you know, even though I'm not imaginative enough to move out of the city, uh, <laughs> new folks have come here and brought new ideas, and I, I'd like to see what this looks like here in uh, Bloomington. So I will, I will reluctantly support this. Um, and if I may add, Mr. Mayor, um, as uh, Councilmember Lohman, to your question about um, kind of deployment, I, I think it's important to point out too, the MOU with Bird allows them to operate a maximum of 200 vehicles in the city. And uh, Camille, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Bird's intention was to roll out 50 vehicles throughout the entire city during this first year. Um, so you think about the density of the number of vehicles out there, it's not a, a huge amount compared to the amount of area that we have here in Bloomington. Um, so not that there can't be issues, but just give, give a, a sense of the, the scope as far as the density of vehicles that would be rolled out in the first year. And Camille, is, was 50 the initial number still for, on Bird's side? Yeah, Mayor Council and Brian, um, I would say we, we always launch in a phased approach. So by the time we get going, uh, obviously the, the winter is, is upon us in a few months. I would say we're not going to exceed more than 50 to 75 vehicles. And that'll also be in a phased approach where we're only going to launch about 20 the first week and then slowly work up. Um, week by week as we start to, you know, educate our users, uh, make sure we're really doing this strategically. So um, I would say it won't exceed by the time we get to winter, no more than 50 to 75 vehicles. We'll evaluate that. And then once spring rolls back around, uh, we'll see, uh, you know, what that sweet spot really is of, of how many vehicles are really great, uh, a good number for the city, um, but not exceeding 200 ever. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I understand, but I just want to make sure I, I am clear about the difference between the map and the MOU. So the map is sort of the broad parameters of what can be done based on policy of this council. And the MOU would uh, define if you are seeing in real time trouble spots, you'd be able to go in and sort of address that without having to come back with a map and go to the council and have us take a look at it. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, Mr. Mayor, Councilor, that is correct. Yes, the MOU, the MOU has language that allows for staff to um, require or dictate geofencing throughout the city, um, you know, as needed. Like I said, it requires the, the uh, operator to put that in place within five business days. Um, I know that previous conversations with Bird, they said they could do that at a much faster rate. So, okay. yes, that allows us to do that. The, uh, the map itself is where the restricted areas are codified. So, um, as uh, council member, I can't remember which one said this before, that those would be areas that any shared vehicle provider, regardless of what their MOU said, would not be able to operate within, correct? Okay, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, I would like to see this move forward, but I, I am reluctant to pass the map right now when the uh, parks are not excluded from that, because I think that's sort of uh, part of what the decision from this council should be is have that discussion as a do we want them in parks do we not want them in parks you know the other issues i can totally see being handled by staff uh, directly with bird but those types of decisions i think are at this level and i don't know how long that would take to do you know if, if you if we move the the um language forward keep working with bird update that map based on conversations with uh, our partners and with staff uh relevant staff and and then bring that one back, if, if that's a possibility. Ms. Mandershain? Just a point of clarification, Mayor members. The city, as I understand it, has already entered into an MOU with Bird. It happened in March of this year. And so if, for example, since Bird is the only entity in Bloomington that has um, the, uh, the, an agreement with the city to be here, the city could simply say, pursuant to its MOU, where it reserves the right to mandate geofencing, could say you can't be in any of the parks. And within five days, they would have to do that. Um, so the, the effect that you're seeking could be done through the existing MOU within five days. 
And, and yeah, and I appreciate that. I guess my concern is that that's not in the map. I mean, and I just I think that is a frankly a decision of the council okay. versus we're running into trouble areas based on the actual data. I think that's where you know we've got good people that can handle that type mm -hmm. of decision. You don't need to come back every week to the council and say, okay, this person asked for it to not be in their yard, so approve a new map. Yeah, no, and, and I, I agree with the, the, the hesitation and some of the questions, perhaps. Um, what I don't agree with, and, and I've said this before, I don't agree with making ordinance or, or legislating to worst case scenarios. I think it doesn't get us anywhere. We can't move along if we do that kind of thing because no matter what we're going to do, we're going to be able to come up with something, a, a, a terrible what if where it's not going to work or it's going to be a bad thing. And I, I, I don't know of, uh, I think in our previous meetings, we, had, we heard examples from other cities where it seems to be working just fine. And, and I, I know they're, I, I think they're putting some restrictions. I, I just read, I believe, on the, along the lake walk in, in Duluth. And that, gives, that shows the example of where they ran into an issue. They just, they were able to contain, to contain it and make, make adjustments on the fly. So um, I, I, you know, the hesitation I, is understandable. I don't know that I necessarily agree with it because I think um, we're, not, we're not necessarily at the, uh, at the forefront of all this. There's plenty of cities that have these things and seem to be operating without a whole lot of issues. But those are my thoughts. Council Member Carter? I guess I just wanted to make one comment about the parks. Um, I still think it would be really helpful to have data on where there might be issues because there are some parks where I don't think it would be a major issue if somebody drove a bird up to it, right? Like, or if they were on a bike path, like, I don't think it would be, I mean, we see people on scooters anyway and electric bikes and like, they're all over. And as long as they're abiding by our laws, right, and they are using the bike path or where they're allowed, like, I mean, certainly some people might get annoyed, but it's not causing, and if with 200, eventually 200 vehicles in the city, it's not we're like we're gonna have this hyper density in like at, I don't know. I mean, maybe we will, but the data will show us that, right? Like, I just think that um, eliminating all parks right off the bat, I don't think would give us the data that would be really interesting around like where do, do the, these birds work as it relates to parks and where are they a really big problem? So anyways, I just wanted to add that. Council Member Loman. So are we ready to vote? Um, I, I think we've gone around, chewed this up pretty good. I, I think if uh, you're looking to make a motion here and we see where we yeah, land, I, mean, I don't do that, Council I mean, Member. if somebody was, you know, more more passionate about this, maybe 100%, they certainly could give the motion. I can make a second. <laughs> I'd be happy to make a motion. <laughs> That's hilarious. That was great. Uh, okay, so the first the first motion, <clears throat> motion to adopt an ordinance updating the areas in which shared vehicles are permitted to operate, thereby amending Chapter 17 of the City Code. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman, to adopt an ordinance updating the areas in which shared vehicles are permitted to operate, updating Chapter 17 of the City Code. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries 6-1 with Councilmember Martin in opposition. Councilmember D'Alessandro, uh, summary, summary publication. publication. Yes, sir. Um, I move to approve a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance amending Chapter 17 of the City Code relating to areas in which shared vehicles are permitted to operate. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman for summary publication on NM 4.3. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And lastly, Alessandro. Yeah, I move to approve a resolution approving the shared vehicle operation zones map. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman to approve, the resol uh, approve a resolution approving the shared vehicle operation zones map. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Motion carries 4-3 with Martin, Nelson, and uh, Coulter in opposition. Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, good discussion. Good, good back and forth. I thought of, uh, good issues brought up on all sides. And um, after all these meetings and all this staff work, darn it, I want to see scooters out there. <laughs> Get them out there. I'd love to. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for having me tonight. Thank you for uh, joining us. Appreciate it. 
Item 4.4 is our final public hearing of the evening. This is uh, a report on our 2021 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, our Keeper Report. Erica Coleman from our HRA is here this late into the evening. Good evening, welcome. <laughs> Good evening. So tonight, um, I am requesting that you hold a public hearing to solicit comments on the fiscal year 2021 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, better known by CAPER. There is no formal action required by the City Council. This is the report that aligns with our consolidated plan, which is our five-year plan that we are part of the consortium with Hennepin County. We are in the second year of our consolidated plan that we are reporting on as the fiscal year or the program year for CDBG runs from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. This is the report period for that. And attached to the staff report was the draft report that is currently open for public comment. I'm asking you to hold a public hearing this evening, after which it will be submitted to Hennepin County as a part of the consortium in which they will hold a public hearing at their board, and then it'll be submitted to HUD. I will stand for any questions. Council, any questions of Ms. Coleman? No questions? With that, I'll open the public hearing item 4.4. This is our public hearing on 2021 CAPER, looking to solicit comments for fiscal year 2021 consolidated annual performance and evaluation report. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak toward this? No one coming forward? Mr. Sable, anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor, council members, no one on the phone. No one on the phone, no one coming forward? Council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.4. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Uh, so there's no public, or there's no council action required on this. This is just, we held our public hearing and yes. oh, very good. Thank you. Thanks for sticking out with us tonight. <laughs> she, 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 yeah, she gets the award. Moving to item 4.5, uh, this is a motion to reconsider adoption of an ordinance amending various chapters of the city code and fee schedule appendix. Uh, Ms. Mandershad, why don't you explain this? I'm sure you can do it better than I can. Uh, Mayor, members, thank you. Uh, so just a, the reason this got messed up is there, uh, when you, we have this functionality in our agenda management software that allows us to duplicate agenda items. Uh, and we use this in a very cost saving, time saving way rather. Um, there was a bit of a glitch in that sometimes uh, the the new text you add in doesn't stick. I've had it happen to me. In this particular instance, um, the person entered the new text and it, uh, they thought they had saved it and moved forward. Everything, the wheels of motion kept going. We tried to fix it um, once we all discovered it and we didn't fix it well enough. So the actual text of the motion wasn't accurate, but the documents themselves were. And we realized this, um, we, well, they were accurate in that that's what we wanted you all to take action on. Um, and then we realized it um, later on in the meeting, uh, or excuse me, the next day rather, when we were circulating it for signatures. By that point, it was too late. So the method by which you have uh, available in your rules of procedure is reconsideration. Um, our rules of reconsideration are a little bit different than Robert's. We are allowed to reconsider both at the same meeting as well as the next regularly scheduled meeting, which is tonight. So you would first act on the reconsideration motion, which is in the text on page 199. If that passes, then you would readopt the uh, documents um, that were already numbered. They will they will be what they were. We'll just have a, a one week later date. Council, any questions on that? No questions? No questions, Council. Then I would move we reconsider the adoption of ordinance number 2022-40 and the resolution number 2022-154 amending several chapters of the city code. Seconded. To correct typographical errors contained in the approval Done. motions for items 4.1 on the August 15th, 2020 city council agenda. I, I can move that, correct? I, I voted in the affirmative. No, I'll second. Sorry. And we have a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro. Any questions? If not, uh, on the, the motion to reconsider, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. 
And with that, I will move to adopt an ordinance number 2022-40, amending chapters 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 of the city code and the fee schedule appendix. Second. Motion by, and a second by council member D'Alessandro to adopt the ordinance as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. And council, I will adopt, uh, I will move the adoption of a resolution number 2022-154, resolution directing summary publication of ordinance number 2022-40, an ordinance amending chapters 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 of the city code and fee schedule appendix. Second. Motion and a second for summary publication. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Thank you for helping us clean that all up. That was... Um, an, an unfortunate kind of mess it was, but I'm glad we got it all cleaned up. Move to item five, our organizational business. Before we do, council, I would move that we extend our deadline, our finished deadline, at least 15 minutes to 11.15 to make sure that we can get this conversation regarding the uh, Burnsville landfill in as appropriate. Second. Motion and a second to extend our time to 11.15 as needed. No later than. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Mr. Market Guard, good evening. Mayor Busey, you see the clock on the wall now. You know, you. <laughs> we know we, you got a half hour. <laughs> All right, uh, Council Members, we have three guests this evening from the MPCA: uh, Dave Benke, Cliff Shirk, and Alex Hawkinson. Uh, they will be uh, presenting t to you tonight regarding the application before them uh, from the Burnsville Sanitary Landfill. Uh, for an expansion. After that, I'll come back and talk about the uh, draft city comment letter to the MPCA on the same. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome. Thanks for sticking with us this late into the evening. Greatly appreciated. Thank you, uh, Mayor and uh, Council members. Uh, we're happy to be here tonight. My name is Dave Benke. I'm the director of our Resource Management and Assistance Division at the Pollution Control Agency. Uh, with me tonight, I have Alex Hokinson and Cliff Shirk, uh, our staff on the Solid Waste uh, Permitting Unit for this uh, facility. So we're here tonight to discuss with you the draft permit for the waste management facility down in Burnsville. Um, Cliff will give you a short presentation regarding the draft permit, uh, its status, and then we'd be happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. So uh, with your permission, Mayor, I'll turn it over to Cliff. Absolutely. Good evening, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Can everyone see my screen just so I know that I'm sharing? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going to give a, a little bit of an abbreviated talk here tonight. Um, I know Council Member Lohman saw this last week, and it won't be quite the same. I know we're short on time here, so I'm going to breeze through this and try and save some time for questions. So first, why are we here? Uh, we have a, a waste problem in the metro. Um, there's about 3.3 million tons of waste generated annually. That equates to about one ton of waste per year per resident. And right now we're at about 47% of our waste is recycled. We are shooting to get that up to 75% by 2030. Um, but right now we're, we're kind of hovering around that 50% zone. And we also have a, a waste to energy facilities that are operating at full capacity. And our compost and organic system is also operating at full capacity, but we do have some facilities coming online. So that, that's growing, but um, we're, we're kind of packed to the gills here. So at the agency, we're, we're trying to prioritize waste management by, by getting it up this, this hierarchy. So as you can see, uh, reduction, reuse, recycling, those are have the most environmental benefits at the top, landfilling at the bottom. Uh, we're trying to focus those efforts at the top and working everything up, but um, we are seeing that landfilling due to that recycling rate is still a need for, for the metro area in particular. So. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the processes that we're running through. I, I'm sure that many of you have, have seen or commented on a number of these, these public comment periods um, through the, the Burnsville process here. Um, at a regional scale, we start at the planning level, and that is by documents like the Metro Policy Plan that set our, our recycling goals and other initiatives and priorities. And then also through what we call the certificate of need process, which helps to identify the need for, for facilities to, to take that waste for landfilling. 
then once we set that, then we, we start to zero in on, on more site specific processes. So one of those is through the environmental review process. If you'll recall, we did um, conduct an environmental impact statement for the Burnsville Sanitary Landfill. And then once we have that review done, then we can move into that permitting phase, which is where we are now. And so this is, um, I'm here tonight to talk about the solid waste permit. This facility also does have other permits that it needs to needs to obtain. So that's the stormwater permit, the air permit, and then other local permits. So for that planning piece, um, the, the purpose is really to support orderly and deliberate development and financial security of waste facilities. So one planning docu document that we use is called the Metro Policy Plan that's revised every six years. Uh, and that will be out for, for public comment here in the fall. So please keep a, keep a look out for that one. The second process is that certificate of need process. Um, for this latest cycle, we did open the, that up for applications back in January of 21. We received applications from four facilities and those four facilities were granted um, certificate of need in May of 2021 on a preliminary determination, went up for public comment, finalized that in October. And then we can't finalize that certificate of need until we have our SEIS completed. So for uh, the Burnsville Sanitary Landfill, that certificate of need was formally issued in April of 22. Second piece is that environmental review. So I just want to remind everyone that that is not a decision document. That is a document that is that is used to inform the decision makers. So um, when we complete that, uh, we look at things uh, across the board here. So that's waste volume composition, groundwater, surface water, the engineering controls that they, they propose for the project, and then other things like air quality and sociological impacts. And then we also do consider other alternatives there, one of those being a no-build alternative. This document was released for, for public comment in draft form in June of 21. It was finalized and then released again for public comment in December of 21, and then it was determined to be adequate in February of 2022. So that moves us into the permitting phase. The purpose of the permitting phase is to provide environmental protection through technical review and permit conditions. So we received this application way back in April of 2019, which is what triggered that environmental review. We could not act on that permit until uh, that review was, was completed. So that was in November of 21. We performed a, a technical adequacy review of the documents that were submitted. So that included uh, not only the, the design, but the, the operations, the environmental monitoring, and then what we call their contingency action plan, which I'll get into a little bit more later. And we were interfacing not only with waste management, but other stakeholders like the city of Burnsville and Dakota County to support that review. So that draft permit was placed on public notice in July. We held a public meeting at the city of Burnsville in August. And then the end of that public comment period is, is next week, so September 6th. So just to orient everyone on the site, uh, north is to the left here. So the city of Bloomington off to the left, the city of Burnsville to the right. Uh, the landfill itself is at the bottom of the image here. And you can get a sense of, of how complicated this is of a region. There's a lot of industrial activity here. You have Kramer Quarry as a big mining operation. They're, they're pumping a lot of groundwater. To support their operations, uh, we have two old landfills in the area, Freeway Landfill and Freeway Dump, and then uh, Burnsville Drinking Water Supply is also in that area. So all of these things um, were considered as we were working on this permit. So just as a reminder, that SEIS, it reviewed the full build out of the landfill. So that was a large increase in capacity of over 16 million cubic yards a large increase in the height of the overall landfill once it's completed. So um, jump from 820 to 1082, so an increase of 262 feet. It did pull the northern edge of the landfill back to the south and reduce that footprint from um, a previously permitted 216 acres to 204 acres. And it, during the SEIS process, uh, it was estimated that this facility would provide an additional 40 years of additional disposal. However, in the solid waste program, we issue our permits in 10 year cycles. So we really have probably four or more permit cycles for this full build out. For this current permit, we are adding about 7 million cubic yards of new waste. And then we are also earmarking some of that space for, for freeway landfill if um, the remedial option is chose to do that dig and haul option. And if uh, Burnsville is chosen as the receiving spot for that. 
And during this permit cycle, we would only get up to elevation about 912, so an, an increase in 92 feet. So this project doesn't only serve the city of Burnsville or Dakota County. Uh, this is a, a, met, a facility that supports um, all the counties in the metro area. So these are forecasts. Uh, these, these are numbers that were put together as we were working on the SAIS. But what it does is it, it gives you a, a snapshot of, of where this waste is coming from. So there, there's a pretty good sliver of it that comes from, from both Hennepin and Dakota counties. And then it also supports the other, other counties in the metro area. And as I mentioned, that Metro Policy Plan is what sets those recycling goals, but that really is a public-private system. So we need cooperation and we need community served and the public to embrace those goals to help us get to that 75% recycling number. We did build in some special permit conditions based on the findings of the SEIS. Uh, there were a number of items that were identified that needed to be addressed during permitting, and, and we, we grouped these into, into three buckets here. So one of those is contaminants of emerging concern. You may have heard PFAS in the news. It's been in the news a lot lately. Uh, we're incorporating that into, not directly into the permit, but addressing that through the agency's PFAS monitoring plan, which is, which is a, a plan that is not only addressing solid waste, but a number of our other programs. We're also adding 1,4-dioxane, which is another emerging contaminant to their permit. A second um, issue that, that we looked at was the potential impacts of the future Kramer Quarry Pit Lake. So the, the mining operation is, is active now. They're pumping a lot of groundwater, but we do know that eventually that facility will close. So that is something that, that we definitely considered as we were looking at this. Uh, one of those, uh, one of the ways that we, we got at that was to require updates to the facility's contingency action plan and the financial assurance. And in the solid waste program, we require um, mixed municipal solid waste facilities to carry financial assurance for their closure, their post-closure, and for their contingency actions, which can include things like erosion or landfill fires, but can also include um, items for, for making sure that we're protecting groundwater. So that plan was updated. Um, currently, they carry over $14 million in financial assurance, and once this permit is issued, that number will increase slightly based on those updates to that contingency action plan. And I also do want to comment, I, I did mention the drinking water sources in the aerial photo that I showed, but given the, the current configuration of the site, it's, there are currently no drinking water receptors. So, so the, re the receptor or the receiver of the groundwater is at this point uh, the Minnesota River. So we use surface water standards for this facility. And then lastly, uh, because operations at this facility were started in the 1960s, there is an area of, of the landfill that does not have a bottom liner underneath it. And um, before they can fill over that unlined area, we did add some special permit conditions that, that request that they do some analysis and reporting that we would have to review and approve. And once we look at that and get a better feel for not only what the current uh, situation is here, but what those future impacts might look like, that's when they have official approval to, to fill over that unlined area, but they can't go over that, that area in, until they supply us that new information, we review it and um, concur with, with what they're recommending. Then another piece, we don't have a, a lot of ways to get at climate change through our rules, but we did make sure to evaluate how this design looks versus um, what, what we know to be a, a changing climate and things like floods and, and rainfalls. Um, they are looking at a pretty high berm down by the river to take this out of the floodplain. It's almost at a 500 year elevation. And uh, just for comparison, the largest flood that we have on record was from 1965, and that did not get even close to this 500 year elevation. For those familiar with the, the city, downtown city of St. Paul, that was the 1965 flood, and that's Union Station on the right. So a pretty, pretty good belly washer, and, and it did flood the streets of St. Paul. We also looked at stormwater management. Our rules require that they design for a 25 year storm. Um, they, they went above and beyond that and designed this facility to manage a 100-year storm, which is over a 7-inch rainfall. So again, a, a pretty big, pretty significant event. And then they also do capture their landfill gas at about a 75% efficiency. They use that to generate electricity. And there are discussions between waste management and the city of Burnsville for that future land, land use. And there's an interest in solar, but also other things like uh, utilizing their landfill gas for, for, say, a district heating system for the city of Burnsville. 
So what can you do? Uh, as I mentioned, the, the comment period is open until September 6th. So we encourage um, the, the city council or residents to, to go to this website and it's a pretty easy process. There's a, there's a big button that says comment and uh, you can either submit written comments that way or you can attach uh, documents that way. And then of course, reduce, reuse, recycle. I think one thing that was interesting through this process is as part of the SEIS, they were um, they did a waste composition study to look at what kind of waste come into this facility. And almost 50% of that material was organics. So we have a we have a lot of room to improve. This is something that, that all of us can can take an initiative to do here and extend the life of this landfill beyond that 40 year estimate. So with that, I will take questions and, and Dave and Alex are are here to help too. Thank you for that. I, I think the one question that jumped into my mind was when you showed the the contributors to the landfill, the the different counties. I, I guess I was surprised to see Hennepin County that high because for years it's been my assumption or my understanding that mixed municipal waste from Hennepin County goes to the to the HERC. And I didn't think it went to landfilling. Is that am I misunderstanding it or is there something I'm missing here? I, the HERC is, is running at full capacity, and I don't believe that they can they can handle the amount of waste generated there. Dave, you, you might know this better than me, though. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, the uh, generation of, of waste in Hennepin County exceeds the capacity at that HERC facility. So, um, you know, with the recycling efforts, with the organics efforts, and with the utilization of waste energy, there still is that amount of waste that needs to be landfilled. There was in the past the utilization of a northern uh, waste energy facility in Elk River um, at the uh, facility up there, they were able to get more of that waste in, but that recently closed and I think you can see um, that uh, if we were to look at the data prior to 22, you'd see that reflected uh, in that increase as well. So, like Cliff said, the waste energy facilities are at capacity. Um, we recognize that uh, we, we still will need land disposal, um, but our goals are to get more of that material out of the waste stream. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if you could, uh, well, so I'll, I'll start here. Uh, I noticed there are nine years on here rather than 10 years uh, on the uh, chart. Is, is that intentional? Because you have 2021 not on there, or am I not counting right? Our current forecasts only go to, oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Council Member Lohman, thank you for the question. Um, our our forecasts only at this point go to, go to 2030. So that was part of that uh, SEIS process where we developed these. Um, beyond that, I, I'm not sure if they'll get beyond that in the in the metro policy plan. Um, they, they may well do that, but for now, this is this is what we're working on. Okay. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about the permitting process and and what you know administratively you can kind of control during that process? Because I found that that to be quite interesting. Um, I didn't realize that you know can so for example, could 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 you shut this down with the permit process if we comment? What's what's what can happen through this commenting process? I, I think it remains to be seen. You know, we're, we're, we have to wait and see what kind of comments come in from from all the different stakeholders. And, and as those come in, we certainly evaluate those. We see if that will um, make, require us to make any changes to the conditions in the permit or, or make sure that we haven't missed something. Um, I, I can't say whether or not that would that would shut this facility down. I I, I don't expect that to happen um, based on the comments, but uh, we certainly take take everything into consideration as those come in. So certainly that is a possibility depending on what the comments come in. And if there's a, a reason for that, you're not restricted by some legislative body that would prevent you from from shutting it down. You you so if we if we were able to to bring forward uh, reasonable uh, items uh, that we thought that uh, really should be considered, uh, you'll take that into account. There's nothing that would restrict you from a, uh, from any rulemaking to do that. Correct. Um, with with the caveat that that our, our permits, we really have to work within our rules, and, and so that, that's something that that at, at times um, is is a benefit and a curse because there are there are certain things that that we have control over, and there there are some things that we may not have as much control over. For example, like like the height of the landfill. So 
we'll certainly take those into consideration, um, but but we're sometimes constrained with with what we can write into our permits based on based on the rules. Thanks for that clarification. I, I just want to stress, um, and I think the mayor uh, has written it uh, quite well in the uh, in the letter uh, around that drinking water uh, uh, with those folks who are um, from an environmental justice standpoint uh, that are around that area. I hope that uh, that you'll consider that very carefully. And I understand what the height uh, that that's a problem right now, um, but uh, certainly that drinking water long term, I'm very concerned about that. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, gents. Thank you for hanging out with us. Um, the um, is is there anybody looking at doing a, another HERC? It just seems like that's a better use of some resources, and I'm just curious as to whether or not that's been considered uh, by anyone and brought to your um, brought to your uh, attention, or if there's been a you know a certificate of need. In that in that realm, brought to anybody's attention. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Dave. I, I think this this might be more in, in your wheelhouse as a as a larger policy item. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilmember. You know that the, the uh, planning effort that uh, Cliff alluded to earlier, um, where the Metro Policy Plan uh, sets out the goals and objectives for the region. Uh, do take into consideration, you know, what can be done with the ways um, and to have projects looked at each one of the counties uh, then prepares their own plans and develops those. And so right now, uh, Hennepin County is developing a plan um, uh, that they are having stakeholder input in regarding to the future of solid waste management in the county. Ramsey and Washington counties have uh, put forward uh, an effort to uh, take the facility at Newport and continue to develop that and remove uh, waste from the, uh, you know, what would have been disposed and, and recover that as resources. Uh, and the other counties are doing similar things. And so um, on the scale of a, a HERC, um, that is a, uh, I think, a, a really large effort uh, right now. Um, I think there are some smaller versions of organics that are being looked at, um, but a facility on that level, um, you'd want to make sure that the uh, facility didn't impinge on your other uh, recycling goals and efforts too. And so um, that's why we look at these facilities on uh, a less than uh, full capacity uh, or full design capacity uh, level um, and make sure that every uh, permit cycle, we can take a look at those for other options as well as they become available. But th those are ongoing discussions uh, across the state on uh, how to utilize the waste. Um, we haven't seen a new facility developed uh, in quite some time. Um, I don't know what's all in uh, some of the federal opportunities for development of things, and maybe that will uh, help speed things along or, or make those more uh, inviting to, to look at. You know, it, it does cost a lot of money to build a facility like that. Uh, and I think once you've committed to that, uh, you know, you're in there for uh, quite a commitment and uh, it takes, um, I think, some joint regional activity sometimes in order to make that happen. Thanks for that. Uh, one other final question then. Um, <clears throat> What would it, what would what would happen to the waste if if you couldn't use the burn fill landfill? Like if if this if you if you denied the permit, what would I don't know Hennepin County do? Like what would happen? Thank you, Mayor and Councilmember. I I think it would be reallocated to a different facility. You know, we're seeing that at Burnsville right now, they were up against their their final capacity for their existing permit. And right now we're diverting a lot of waste down to one of their Iowa facilities. So um, there are a lot of permitted landfills in, in the area, both the metro area and the outstate area. So I, I, I would envision that, that that's, that's what would happen to, to that waste. And, and there's capacity in those facilities? Yes, I, I mean, a lot, of them, a lot of them have a fair amount of capacity. You know, that's something that we, we look to the certificate of need process to help drive. 
Um, but but yes, many many of the facilities in, in the metro are, are not at their final capacity. Okay, thank you. Council, unless there are other additional pressing questions, uh, this was an information item, basically. And what we do, we actually have an item that we actually need to discuss and move on tonight. So what I would like to do is uh, thank our, our, our friends from the MPCA who've joined us this late in the evening. Thanks for sticking with us. Thank you for the information. Uh, thank you for your work on this. Uh, greatly appreciated. We're going to let you go now. We're going to have a discussion uh, regarding the, uh, the, the draft comment letter that we're working on, and you'll be seeing it shortly. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you much. Thank you. Mr. Markegaard, this is, the, this is the thing we needed to get done with this discussion item, correct? That's correct, uh, Mayor Busey, Council Members. Uh, we are at the end of the road in terms of comments, and it's been a very long road. Let me see if I can advance these slides. So this would actually be a Bloomington's eighth comment letter uh, starting back in 2019, um, looking at the certificate, certificate of need process, the environmental review process, and then the permitting process. In terms of our comment letter, as I mentioned, comments are due September 6th. Uh, the letter does request uh, MPCA denial of the permit. Uh, for a variety of reasons. And then in the absence of denial, I uh, request a variety of additional conditions. I know we're up against your uh, deadline tonight, so I'm happy to go into a lot more detail, or I can stop uh, here knowing that you've had a chance to review the letter in your packet. Council, any very specific questions, clarifications in this letter? I think it's a very good letter. Uh, I think it's restating many of the concerns that we've stated in the past and um, just hoping that eventually they get given the credit they deserve, given their due. Um, but I appreciate you putting this all into, into workable form here for us. We can counsel anything on this? No, happy to make the motion. In fact, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Let's do it. Um, so uh, I move that we authorize transmittal of the attached draft comment letter to the MPCA. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Carter to authorize transmittal of the draft comment letter to the MPCA. No further council discussion on this. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thanks, Drew. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks for letter number nine on this. It's appreciated, and your work on this whole project is appreciated. I know it's been a bit of a thankless slog and a challenge, but appreciate what you've done. So thanks. Thank you, Council. Uh, council item 5.2 city council policy and issue update. I'll just do very quickly a quick recap of our uh, council listening session. We had four speakers, uh, Sally Ness, Julene Bergerson, uh, Bruce Shapey, and Mike List. We'd like to point out that two of those four we've not heard from before. So those are brand new folks who have come before us to speak and we appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Ness uh, was commenting again about a conditional use permit that was issued 13 years ago and we we're trying to work toward a uh, a, a, a direction of what might be accomplished by this discussion. Uh, Ms. Bergeson had concerns about the proposed property tax levy and questioned whether or not our commitment to public safety was legitimate, uh, despite the, 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 uh, the money that we're looking to allocate toward additional firefighters and additional police officers. Uh, Mr. Shapey uh, spoke in support of the climate emergency resolution and had some good ideas about how we might want to accomplish that uh, the, the goals of the resolution. And Mike List, uh, he was a block captain or a block uh, host for a national night out and had good positive reviews with the exception of a political organization that stopped by his national night out party and he was wondering how to deal with that in the future. And it was a, a good question and we, we gave him the direction uh, to work with um, uh, Katie in the police department and to make sure that we clarify for the future years about how uh, hosts can, can manage that situation if, if folks would show up like that. So that is the quick rundown of that. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. I realize I'm uh, one of the few things standing between you and the door at 1113, but boy, do I have an offer for you this evening. Uh, once every five years, we are required to uh, do RFP 
for our auditing services. And uh, that process is beginning, and we, uh, we would like the uh, participation of a council member on our RFP committee uh, to receive and review the audit um, proposals. So uh, I see a lot of people avoiding eye contact right now. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm certainly encouraging uh, uh, one of seven people sitting here this evening to uh, pl please uh, <laughs> indicate your interest uh, in the next several days. You can feel free to contact me. I know it's a big decision to make this evening, so if you want, if you want a night of sleep to reflect on it, that's fine. I think that would be fair. That would be fair. Anything further, Mr. Berbrugge? Oh, I think I've done enough, Mr. That's Mayor. plenty. <laughs> Council, anything to bring forward? Councilmember D'Alessandro and Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember I'll take two minutes just to uh, issue a, a, a point of personal thank you to the city for its focus on uh, suicide prevention this month. Um, near and dear to my heart specifically and as a member of the LGBTQ community, um, we know that uh, – LGBTQ folks are impacted by suicide more often, and it's largely due to the stigma associated with um, their uh, their peers and and their families and uh, organizations around them. And so, um, knowing that there's an opportunity to get help through Save uh, is a huge thing, and I'm very grateful for their work. And I'm grateful to know that there's a text-oriented approach to to getting help too. So that was great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, very briefly, uh, there was something in the one weekly regarding the Burnsville uh, freeway landfill. And just at some point, if we have any additional information about that, I don't need it right now. I just was very concerned about what I read about that proposal. Beyond what we just talked about? Or? Yeah, the existing freeway landfill. Oh, the freeway landfill. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. They, they, have, they have three dumps in Burnsville. That's true. They do. So. Yes. I won't say more <laughs> on that. <laughs> it irritates some friends. But um, And then the second item I, I had was if it's possible at some point to have any conversation about the projects on Lost, if those are the, still the projects we want to go with. I know there was concerns at the legislature regarding the golf course and and or if there were other opportunities to switch some of those out or look at some things differently. Um, obviously, this is not the time to do that, but um, I would be interested in that. And I think the city manager knows a couple of my thoughts on it. But so, Mr. Verbrugge? Uh Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, when we come back for discussion about our 2023 legislative platform, I think that'd be uh, the ideal time. Yep. Uh, and uh, we'll do that in plenty of time to uh, give council some time for deliberation. Council, anything else tonight? Nothing else? I look for a motion to adjourn. So move. Motion and a second to adjourn. No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thanks much for sticking with us late tonight. Good discussions. Thank you much. Thanks to staff. Thanks to our audience, our dedicated audience. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>